14, right? 14, yes, sir. Okay, the uh, City Council will now reconvene for the uh, June 23rd regular meeting. May we have the roll call, please? The record will reflect that Council Member Duffield has an excused absence. Okay, uh, Mr. Harp, do we have a closed session report? Uh, yes, Mayor Selich, we have a brief closed session report this evening. Um, I'm pleased to announce that after months of negotiations between the City of Newport Beach and the Friends of the Fire Rings, uh, the City and Friends have reached a tentative settlement agreement. The tentative settlement agreement is conditioned upon, uh, conditioned upon the Council authorizing City staff to implement, implement Plan 17, uh, which is the plan that was approved by the California Com Coastal Commission on June 11th, 2015, and that will be considered by the City Council this evening. If the City Council decides to go forward with Plan 17, the parties will execute a settlement agreement which will resolve all the disputes between the parties and uh, the, a copy of that settlement agreement will be available once it's fully executed. All council members uh, voted in favor of the settlement agreement except for Councilmember Duffield who is not here this evening and Councilmember Curry who voted against it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, would you please uh, rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance led by Councilmember Curry, followed by the invocation by Pastor Rick Myers of the Calvary Chapel of San Juan Capistrano. Please join me in the pledge to our flag. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which, which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with, with liberty and justice for all. Please join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we come before you this evening asking for the presence of your Holy Spirit to be in this place. I thank you for the men and women represented on this council and ask for your blessings to be upon each of them as they serve this beautiful community of Newport Beach. Grant them the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding and discernment they need to engage in discussion and to make decisions according to your will, way, and purpose. We thank you, Lord, for the freedom that we have in this great nation to proclaim your holy name and to rejoice in all you have done through your Son. We thank you, Lord, for your love and grace and tender mercy you give to us each day. Father, I ask for your protection provision on this council person. Give each of them clarity of thought and a pure heart as they seek to serve the citizens of Newport Beach. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Okay, we don't have any presentations this evening. We did those during our study session. So, Madam Clerk. Notice to the public, the city provides a yellow sign-in card to assist in the preparation of the minutes. The completion of the card is not required in order to address the city council. If the optional sign-in card has been completed, it should be placed in the box provided at the podium. The City Council of Newport Beach welcomes and encourages community participation. Public comments are generally limited to three minutes per person to allow everyone to speak. Written comments are encouraged as well. The City Council has a discretion to extend or shorten the time limit on agenda or non-agenda items. As a courtesy, please turn cell phones off or set them in the silent mode. Now is the time for announcements and matters which council members would like, <clears throat> members have asked to be placed on a future agenda. Councilmember Piotr. None. Uh, Councilmember Petros. Uh, just a real quick announcement, Mr. Mayor. On the um, 18th of June, uh, the Air Quality Management District held a uh, uh, public hearing or an open house, I'm sorry, at the uh, Ho Conference Center regarding uh, Hickson uh, Industries, a metal plater uh, over on the west side of Newport Beach. Uh, Hickson has repeated, has repeated violations of air quality emissions related to hexavalent chromium, a known carcinogen. This is a serious <clears throat> matter. And uh, the room was filled with uh, my, my neighbors uh, and our neighbors from Costa Mesa. I will let uh, the public know that that meeting was held by the AQMD and was attended by myself and Ms. Kim Brandt, our uh, Community Development Director. Uh, the city is, uh, understands the significance of this matter. Uh, while our hands are tied over the issue of the emissions, 
Uh, we do believe that the Air Quality Management District is doing their work to ensure that this uh, matter is addressed. Uh, if you are on the west side of town and have any questions about Hickson, I would strongly encourage you to get in touch with the city, either through me, the council member for District 2, or Ms. Brandt, uh, to learn more about what the matter is and uh, what it means to you and how you can be involved. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Dixon. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. I have a couple of announcements. Um, today was the beginning of junior lifeguards. There are more than 1,300 young boys and girls participating in the program. So the purpose of my message today is look out for these uh, young folks. There'll be lots of kids with backpacks on bikes headed to the pier, Balboa Pier, for the next eight weeks. And all are required to wear helmets while on their bikes, bike safety. And the fire department lifeguards will have staff on the island uh, and peninsula providing crossing guard control. But please remind everyone to keep a watch out for these kids to promote bike safety. Also, a quick announcement uh, for the uh, City Arts Commission presents Shakespeare by the Sea, The Tempest, on Saturday, July 18th, and As You Like It, in Sunday, July 19th. I'll probably announce this again, but I think that's going to be exciting uh, at Bonita Canyon Sport, Sports Park, uh, so mark your calendars. Uh, on a serious note, I just want to spend a few minutes and talk about uh, an event that's going on of great interest in our community and specifically in the uh, Lido Balboa Peninsula community. And as a representative of District 1, I wanted to share with you that I have heard from many, many people about the need to preserve St. James the Great Church, which is designated in the general plan as private institutional. Many of you know I had a town hall meeting last week uh, that filled the room and beyond uh, with concerned members of the community. I know a lot of time and energy went into the development of the general plan and that the general plan, which was adopted by the council and the voters in 2006, is, I quote, a vision for the city's future and a strategy to make that vision a reality. Based on my review of the general plan, it is clear that having local community churches that are easily accessible to residents is a big part of what makes our community special, and I am supportive of this approach to land use planning. I also think it's important for the community to know that I take the general plan seriously because it is designed to, quote, provide protection and preservation for existing neighborhoods, end quote, and lets people know that the general types of uses that are permitted around your home, quote, unquote, out of our general plan. Giving people a sense of certainty about what future land uses may exist in a neighborhood is important to me, and I am glad that the general plan gives us a comprehensive approach to how land uses interact with each other. I also appreciate the large diversity of faith that we have in this community and the many churches that allow the residents to practice their faith in our community. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Muldoon. Uh, thank you. I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in with the same sentiments, but I would like to concur with uh, Councilwoman Diane Dixon's statements. I received a lot of communications, emails on this issue, and I'm a big supporter of uh, St. James of Grant and the uh, zoning as is. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Curry. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, I was privileged to join the mayor uh, at this year's employee uh, recognition lunch. Uh, we have such a great group of employees who work for the city, who work hard day in and day out to make this a great place for all of us to live. And it was an honor to be there to say thank you to them uh, for the job that they all do day in and day out. I know the mayor will probably have more to say about that in his remarks. And let me also address the St. James issue because I'm very concerned, as are my colleagues, about the uh, lack of facilities and the lack of zoning and the lack of availability for new churches in our community. We have churches who meet in restaurants, who meet in public buildings and schools and libraries because we don't have enough space uh, to build churches uh, or synagogues uh, to respond to the need in our community. So before we have any land use decisions that remove that, I'm going to look very carefully uh, at how we preserve and protect uh, those areas in our community that are set aside for sacred spaces. I'll have to say, personally, I thought it was uh, deplorable what, how the Episcopal Bishop dealt with the prior congregation, and I think it's despicable how he's dealt with this congregation. And so uh, I'm going to look uh, very carefully at any decision that comes before the council uh, that would take away space in our community for uh, 
uh, future religious communities. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, as usual, it's been a busy two weeks um, uh, since our council meeting on June the 9th. On June the 10th to the 12th, the Coastal Commission uh, met in the city council chambers for three days. This is the third time the commission has been here since we opened the, uh, opened the council chambers, and I think probably the third time ever. I don't think they came here before. And um, it, was, uh, it, it was really a um, good experience, I think, for the Coastal Commission in the city. We gave the Coastal Commission a welcome, and we presented to them a video of all of the things that the city of Newport Beach does, uh, really an emphasis on shared values, if you will, because we didn't think the Coastal Commission was really realizing all of the stuff that the city of Newport Beach was doing. And I want to thank our staff, um, <clears throat> Tara Finnegan and uh, Kim Brandt, Laura Detweiler, and Dave Kiff did a terrific job on the, uh, on the video. I received a lot of uh, favorable comments on it. And one of the things I pointed out that I didn't realize um, until I did that presentation to the Coastal Commission was that I looked up on the Green Building Council site, and there's 700,000 LEED certified uh, sustainable projects in the country and out of the 700,000, 32 of them are civic centers, and the Newport Beach Civic Center is the highest rated uh, LEED certified civic center in the country. So it's uh, something I think we can all be proud of for our, for our civic center. It was also a good week for Newport Beach because we had a number of projects up in front of the Coastal Commission that got approved, uh, most notably the, uh, the firings, which we'll discuss later, and also a uh, eelgrass mitigation plan, which is really a... Uh, pioneering effort on the part of our city, a lot of hard work on our Harbor Resources and Harbor Commission uh, folks to uh, get this done and get this through. It's been about a nine-year effort, I think, to get this approved. And so it was a terrific uh, week for us with the Coastal Commission, uh, better than a lot of the other ones we have. Right, Mr. Kiff? Um, on June the 13th, um, I attended the Little Balboa Island Association meeting once a year. I give them a an update, kind of a mini uh, state of the city ad address, and uh, uh, they were very appreciative of that. Also on the 13th, we had the uh, Arts Commission um, art exhibition here in the community room, and I was able to present the awards to all the winning artists. It was a very well attended event. Um, the doors to the community room were open on all sides. There was art inside, outside. Um, uh, refreshment and, and wine. So I think uh, everyone that attended had a terrific time. There was also tours of the sculptures in the Sculpture Garden Park. And like I said, it was just a lot of folks attended that, uh, that event. Then on June the 18th, Councilmember Curry mentioned the Employee Appreciation Luncheon. This is something we do once a year for our employees. We have a very hardworking and dedicated uh, staff in the, in the city. They do public service. Uh, and their job is to make all of our lives easier as residents of, uh, of Newport Beach, although sometimes we don't realize it, but if you look in the big picture, that's exactly what they do. So um, I was uh, proud to be able to say a few remarks there, and uh, also, although I'm not quite officially a city employee, I did get a 20-year pin, so I appreciated that. Um, the uh, June the 20th is the, uh, was the Balboa Island Pancake Breakfast. That's an annual event, and uh, uh, great pancakes and eggs and sausage out there. And uh, they gave out the awards to uh, all the winners for the Balboa Island Parade, which, again, was very successful this year. And then later that afternoon, there was the uh, historic home tour on Balboa Island, which, uh, again, was a very successful event. And you might want to keep an eye out in the... Uh, Winter time, they have the holiday home tour that comes up uh, in early December, if I'm not mistaken. And then, actually, the, the most terrific thing I did in the last two weeks was today, and it was at noontime. I got a last-minute um, call, which is why I wasn't at the Junior Lifeguards, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Dixon, for um, a program that... Uh, took off from the Balboa Pavilion. It's sponsored by uh, Mariner's Church and um, the Balboa Angling Club. And uh, it's for a, it was for a group of 40 kids from an area called Mini Street in Santa Ana. And these kids did public service as part of the, um, the, uh, the social improvement of that area. It's a redevelopment area, as I said, in Santa Ana. 
And so these kids did public service, and as a reward for their public service, uh, the Balbo Angling Club and the Mariners Church provided them a half-day fishing trip. And um, they were really excited to get out there and go fishing, just a bunch of excited kids. And it was just terrific to, uh, to uh, be there, to see them off, and to say a few words to them and thank them for doing their public service for their community. And it's really an example of what the Balboa Angling Club does and uh, why we should be proud that we supported them in our budget this year to help them rebuild their clubhouse because it's just an example of the kind of things that the Angling Club does as well as Mariner's Church. So that was, uh, that was terrific. And then lastly, um, I want to share with the council and, uh, and the public that the uh, the city, we received the American Society of Civil Engineers Urban Development Project of the Year of the Ward for our Sunset Ridge Park. And uh, this is a little late. It was actually formally presented to us at uh, an uh, ACSE function back in February. And Mr. Webb, would you like to comment on uh, how we got this? Yes, we, uh, we had the opportunity to apply for this award and uh, competed against uh, the county and the area. And they chose our project as one of the top ones, and of course it won the award of the year. Uh, this is a terrific park. If you haven't been up to Sunset Ridge Park, I encourage you all to go up there. It's a wonderful park. Took a long time getting there. We are very honored and proud that they recognize the park and gave us this award, and happy to present it to you, Council, tonight. Okay, well, congratulations to the staff. A lot of hard work went into this project as well by, you know, number of departments, uh, parks and recreation, public works, planning, so terrific job, and it was a long road to actually get it done. Um, Mr. Kiff goes back many years on just trying to acquire the land and getting through all the regulatory hurdles. So getting an award like this is icing on the cake. Madam Clerk. Public comments on consent calendar. This is the time in which council members may pull items from the consent calendar for discussion. Items 1 through 22. Public comments are invited on consent calendar. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes. Before speaking, please state your name for the record. If any item is removed from the consent calendar by a council member, members of the public are invited to speak on each item for up to three minutes per item. All matters listed under consent calendar are considered to be routine and will all be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. Council members have received detailed staff reports on each of the items recommending an, recommending an action. There will be no separate discussion of these items prior to the time the City Council votes on the motion unless members of the City Council request specific items to be discussed and are removed from the consent calendar for separate action. Okay, thank you. So does any member of the public wish to comment on any item on the consent calendar items 1 through 22? This is consent calendar. Please come forward and uh, state your name. I saw a lot of hands don't all come up one time. Uh, on behalf of uh, a lot of members here in the Newport Beach area, the Newport Harbor Elks, the Newport Charitable Fund Organization, and many, many generous people, on April the 29th of this month, we had a... Uh, an event, a golf tournament, and we raised about $37,000 that we're gonna to present today. And the reason we did that was to, to get two new canines for you guys, plus the training. So I'm honored and proud to do this for you guys. We all are, we all are and we appreciate so much. And we appreciate so much what the department does for us here in Newport Beach. So. Could you, uh, could you introduce yourself and everyone that's up there with you, please? Yeah, my name is Dan Roach. Stay close to the mic, Dan, because okay, the people at you. home can't hear you. Yeah, my name is Dan Roach, and with me is Sharon Dearborn, and behind me is Tom Anderson. I forgot the dog's name. I got to see it out here in the parking lot. Kajo. 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 Two German Shepherds are 130 
Mexican Chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs>
On item 12, I would just point out that uh, when I was first elected, uh, it was brought to my attention that this park was on the books for eight years and nothing had been done. And I would just point out that within uh, nine months, nine months with the good work of our staff and maybe a little bit of council attention, uh, we got this park in. So I am delighted that Sunset View Park is in. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Dixon. Uh, Pulling item number seven, has that been pulled? No. No, item number seven, please. Okay, so with that, I'll entertain a motion for the consent calendar. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I move the balance of the consent calendar, items one through 22, with the exceptions of items six and seven, which have been pulled, item 11, which will has been an abstention by Council Member Piotr, item 14, which is continued until July 14th. Second. Okay, please vote. Prior to reading the votes, I'll read the ordinance titles for items three, four, and five. Item three, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach, granting a non-exclusive solid waste franchise to Hartfield Construction Corporation, a California corporation, to provide solid waste collection services upon the city streets and within the City of Newport Beach. Ordinance number 2015-18, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach, granting a non-exclusive solid waste franchise to James Blomberg, a sole proprietor to provide solid waste collection services upon the city streets and within the city of Newport Beach. And item five, ordinance number 2015-19, an ordinance of the city council of the city of Newport Beach, granting a non-exclusive solid waste franchise to Praisler Hauling and uh, Demolition Inc., a California corporation to provide solid waste collection services upon the city streets and within the city of Newport Beach. Come up. Thumbs up or no. Aye. With that, the motion carries unanimously, 6-0. Okay, so the first uh, item on the, uh, on the consent calendar that was pulled was item number six, proposed on-street and off-street parking rate increase. Uh, do you wish to speak to that, Councilmember Muldoon? Uh, just that I'll be lodging a no vote. Okay, Councilmember Piotr, did you want to speak to that? Uh, yes, I would. Uh, I'm trying to get clarification from staff. Part of, you know, this is a great part of the income that the city has to offset the cost of the visitors. And so I, I'm active in, or anxious to actually maximize the revenues. Uh, on the other hand, I don't want to force people out of the parking lots and into the neighborhood where it's free parking. And so I would like to explore some of the demand or dynamic pricing opportunities that we would have specifically on the pier lots, but also perhaps for the, for the parking meters themselves. So there's a balance there, even if it meant slightly less revenues uh, to keep the people parking in the lots versus in the neighborhoods would be preferable. Uh, so I'm thinking that, you know, if, for, and I use Cornell Mars as an example because I walk down there a lot and I know it's not part of our discussion tonight that during the week, even, even during the summer, the parking lot is mostly empty. I shouldn't say mostly empty. There's a lot of empty spaces. And, so, and I see people walking down the bluff, so I know that they're parking in the neighborhood. And it makes me wonder if we were to lower the price on weekdays during the summer to maximize the use during, of the lot, that we might not actually get a decrease in overall revenues, even though the rate went down, but with the goal of trying to enhance our neighborhoods by getting some of the parking off the streets and into the lot. So I guess the question is, is what kind of research have we done as far as dynamic pricing? What kind of occupancies have you seen in these parking lots weekdays versus weekends during peak hour, peak season as well as off season? And can we perhaps do some pricing fluctuations where we can go out there and tentatively price it at one price to see what kind of occupancy we get and then adjust it from there? Because I know we're already doing that in some of the meters where somebody comes in and pays for the first two hours and the third hour is a little bit more expensive at the same meter. So we've got some sophisticated meters out there as well as the payment system in the lots. So we've got what I would look at proposal tonight as a one size fits all and we're just ratcheting up the price, which you know government's really good at doing. But I would like to do more market, in market incentive and market sensitive type pricing with the eye of protecting our neighborhoods. So if staff can respond to that. 
So I think that's a terrific idea, especially at Corona Del Mar State Beach, where you do have the uphill streets have no meters at all, so it's free versus sometimes, I think, fairly early in the day, a $4 an hour charge, which I agree, I think, is is too much because you'll see very few people parking there. Probably, we, we don't seem to have that problem as much at the Balboa side because we do have meters on the on-street parking. But um, I would love to look at that with, with uh, Dan and his staff and our parking consultant, Standard Parking. We did try to make a run at that with Corona Del Mar and the Coastal Commission said no flat rate, not dynamic pricing. I'd like to try to review that and see if we could go lower than the amount that we're set at now. I don't think the Coastal Missions Commission is going to care if we go lower and take a look at that. So um, I think staff would like to do that as well. Now around Balboa Pier, we have a lot of on-street parking in the neighborhoods that there are no meters, correct? Or are we now permit pricing around those areas or permit parking around those areas? I don't know that we have very much besides the residential areas. Correct. But uh, the, all the commercial areas are, um, are, are metered, metered. And, and have a have a tiered pricing structure. But a lot of people will park in the residential areas in order to avoid the 20 bucks that they and it, get as charged. And as Mayor Pro Tem Diane Dixon knows, uh, the, the, the whole discussion going on about the RP3 program, and folks are kind of lukewarm about doing that. But. We have approval of the item. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, I'll open it for public comments. Anybody wish to comment on this item? Okay, so seeing no one, Mayor. I'll bring it back for a vote. Yes. Uh, is this motion include reevaluating some of the uh, opportunity for dynamic pricing, or is it just the staff recommendation? Yeah, recommendation? I will be voting against this then. Okay, please vote when the screen comes up. Prior to reading the vote, I'll read the ordinance title for... Ordinance number 2015-20, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach, amending Newport Beach Municipal Code section 12.44.040 to increase on-street parking meter fees. Council Member Muldoon. With Council Members Piotr and Muldoon voting no, the motion carries 4-2. Okay. Uh, next item pulled is item number seven. This is the second reading of the ordinance regulating and limiting vessels propelled by water above the surface of Newport Harbor. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Dixon, you pulled this. Would you rather have public comment first or would you like to make some comments? We could have public comments first, but I will want to make comments following that. Thank, um, thank you. I'm sure you will. <laughs> okay, so we'll open this item up for public comments. So anyone that wants to comment on the uh, regulations limiting the jet packs, please come forward. State your name for the record. Uh, thank you, Council. My name is Craig Kennedy. I'm the president of the Newport Towers Homeowners Association. We're an eight-story condominium building that's right on the turning basin on Coast Highway. I sent each of you an email on the 15th of June. I'm hopeful that you all saw that. I did receive a response from uh, Councilman Piotr, and I appreciated that. Um, I don't think that people realize that is a mixed-use area. We have a lot of residences as well as uh, a lot of other kinds of uses there, lots of party boats and other things. So people tend to think of that at the end of Mariner's Mile as really a commercial area. But there are a lot of residences within that area, including ours. We have about 90 residents in our condominium building. These jetpacks operate approximately 15 feet from our pier often. They're right there. And the noise travels across. Of course, our building is cantilevered, cantilevered over the water. So the, the sound comes across the water and right up our building. It's almost like they're right on our balconies. They are like a loud vacuum cleaner on our balconies all the time and a loud fire hose, which is pounding there. And this goes on all day long. It's an unrelenting kind of noise that just never ceases. On the weekend days, it starts at 9 and goes till 5. It just never ends. So this is a horrible nuisance to all of us. And we really hope that this is not a use that can be used there. This is really more like parasailing, where the people come to Newport Beach. It's an obviously a wonderful activity for our, uh, for our residents, as well as people who are visiting. But it's something that should be done in the open ocean, where there's plenty of room. In addition to the noise, I mean, I look down at it all the time, and everybody has to avoid these things. I mean, every single boat that goes by, the rowers, the 
uh, all the folks that are you know, sailing regattas and whatnot, they're constantly having to avoid them. I'm just bringing my own Duffy into the, my dock the other night. I had to make three different turns to avoid these people because most of them are amateurs. They've never done this before. They're all over the place. They're out of control. Uh, very few of them are really skilled at it. So this is just not an appropriate use in this area. It's something that should be done in the open ocean and should be available to residents and visitors to Newport Beach there. Thank you for your time. Okay. Okay. May I just, excuse me, may I just ask you uh, a question? Sir, there's a question for you. I thank you for your comments. Um, had you been uh, aware of the jetpack issue as we've been debating this now for several months, but now it's come into your immediate area you're immediately experiencing, you're now most we recently did, experiencing. We, I have to be candid. I mean, this has been going on for a couple of years mm -hmm. and it's gotten worse and worse and worse. And it's the kind of thing that just grates on you at first, you know, you put up with it. But then as you see, it's been relegated just to our area now. I mean, the, the, the latest versions of this is that they must operate in the turning base. And that's like, you know, within a few feet of our balconies. It's really awful. Okay. And All right. So, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, Mike Glenn, resident of Balboa Peninsula. Uh, I agree that uh, you know you have to dodge other craft in the harbor. That applies to all watercraft. Um, but I do take issue with the way that what we're proposing here is essentially a government enforced monopoly. We're allowing one single operator to operate these vehicles in the harbor. No competition. Uh, now, I'm a fan of allowing them to operate, and I'm probably the uh, only one in the room that's going to take this ground. Um, but uh, I think we should seriously consider two permits to allow for fair operation of these vehicles and fair competition inside the harbor. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, my name is Judy Cole, and I'd just like to bring to your attention once again uh, our opinion on the unsuitability of the jetpack type business inside our harbor. The footprint required to operate safely and without being a nuisance to residents and other harbor users is too large for our busy harbor and the way it was configured. The pending anchorage off the west end of Lido complicates it even further. While the promises of compliance made by Jetpack America at the last council meeting may have been in earnest, the reality is that they do not seem to be able to operate within the guidelines of the permit. They continue to pose a nuisance when they come too close or stay too long. This impacts not only nearby residents, but other harbor visitors and users. Further, according to several real estate brokers and agents, the Jetpack operation will decrease nearby property values. Most people prefer a serene harbor view over an extreme sports spectacle. The jetpack operators also continue to exceed the speed limit. It just is the nature of the activity. We've said this time and time again. When the flyer exceeds the speed limit, the jet ski operator has to speed up and or spin around to catch up with the flyer because the hose is now connected to both vessels. When this happens, it creates even larger wakes than normal, which impacts nearby docks, vessels, and other harbor users. It's hard to believe that either operator is aware of what's going on to, around them. To further complicate the scenarios, flyers are encouraged to catapult, dive bomb, torpedo underwater, and or helicopter 360s. This is right off their website. The speed itself creates a dangerous environment when the harbor is busy and the maneuvers just increase the probability of an issue. No other vessel in the harbor is allowed or would be allowed to operate in this manner. Why the exception for water propelled vessels? We do not understand why the city is allowing Jetpack America to operate in reliance on promises that really can't be kept. Promises that are not even in keeping with their marketing and their actual operations in other areas. They are not appropriate in harbors like ours, dotted with islands and mooring fields and marinas, five mile an hour speed limit, and with narrow navigation channels and turning bases surrounded by residences. To those on the council that voted no on the ordinance at the last meeting, we urge you to stick to your guns. 
To the others, we urge you to give proper credence to the original Harbor Commission recommendation and the majority of residents and harbor users. Step up to the plate and do the right thing for our harbor. Both private and commercial operations should be banned in the harbor. Let them operate in the open ocean. Other operators do it successfully all around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, yes, good evening, Mayor and Council members. My name is George Schroeder. Um, first thing I'd like to say is I like jetpacks. I'm in favor of them. I have nieces and nephews, quite a few now. I think I have about 20, and they would like to use these things. But I just have to say I am a little bit perplexed, and I don't understand how this use in our harbor makes any sense. Uh, to Council members Scott Piotr and uh, Diane Dixon, I want to thank you for not supporting this concept at the last council meeting, and also Kevin Muldoon did vote not to support the concept then. Um, if we had a jet ski business that wanted to rent jet skis, and by the, the very nature of, of the b b business, when they would rent these jet skis out to p people, just the very use of them, they would exceed the five mile an hour speed limit that Business would probably not get a permit to operate here. We don't have one. We have Segway businesses, bicycle businesses, but we don't have jet skis. This is a brand new concept. It's a new use that just came up in the last few years. One got in here. Then when it gets in here, we find out it's not compatible with our harbor. We have kids in sailing boats learning how to use them. We had people on paddle boards, okay? We have a harbor where the speed limit is supposed to be five miles an hour. Uh, now we have a permit that's been kind of modified where they can have two jet skis. They can fly people at tandem, which means they could be, you know, queued up with a lower expense to have two people in the air at all times, okay? Uh, and then they don't obey their permit and quit at 5 o'clock. They go to 620. I mean, to me, it doesn't make any sense. And, and what I would like for any council member that does choose to vote to support this, before you vote yes, please give me an explanation why you listened to your Harbor Commission at the last special council meeting on the mornings and permit fees and took their counsel and advice, but when it comes to this, you impanel a Harbor Commission, they study the issue, they take public comment on it, public testimony on it, and then when they make their recommendation to you, you choose to not use it and go a different direction. I would just like an explanation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any other speakers on this subject? Member of the council, my name is Dean O'Malley. I'm the president of Jetpack America. Uh, since I was unable to attend the last city council meeting, I want to provide a few updates on our operation and to re respond to a few comments that were made in the last meeting. We are now just about one month into our new operating process in the Turning Basin, and we are continuing to refine our process and make improvements. Here are just a few of the notable changes. To ensure we stay in our permanent operating area, we have installed a GPS trolling motor on our pontoon boat, which allows us to set pinpoint accurate anchor locations throughout the Turning Basin to stay within our permitted area. We have tightened up our scheduling process to ensure all flights finish before the 5 p.m. cutoff time. We've added noise dampening foam to the outside of our jet skis, and we just today added a second layer to the inside, which will further reduce the sound output. And as I've previously mentioned, the size of the, of the operating area in the turning basin essentially drops the noise to zero from most points across the area. Uh, since there were questions about our operation in the last meeting, I want to clarify that we have, in fact, been operating multiple packs in the harbor under our marine activities permit for the past four years. This is nothing new. It's not something we do every day, but only when customer demand warrants it. We haven't had any issues doing so in the past, and we wouldn't anticipate any going forward. Uh, if our permit is modified as such that we're restricted to a single jet pack, that will, in fact, be a force reduction in our business, which obviously we would like to avoid, but we will certainly respect whatever the decisions are made here. In response to the quote-unquote close calls that were mentioned, 
It's possible that these may have been when one of our experienced instructors was flying a child as part of our tandem jetpack experience. In these situations, our instructors are very, very experienced they, and they can safely fly close enough so the child can wave at their parents, take photos, and have a good experience from start to finish and a safe experience, most importantly. As I've always said, safety is our number one priority and always will be. Um, I hope that we can continue to let our track record speak for itself in this area. In terms of community outreach, we have proactively met with Harbor Master Mike Jansen to explain our operation and invited him to come out and watch our location or watch our, our operation in action and weigh in with any concerns. To date, no issues have been reported by us or by the Harbor, uh, Harbor Patrol to us. We also met with the sea base director, Tom Hartman, since he puts hundreds of sailing students and campers into the main channel near our operating location. Not only did he have no issue with our operation, he specifically requested a flight demonstration for his kids in front of the sea base. We hope we can get that approved through Harbor Resources. Uh, on the commercial side, I personally met with the general managers of Billy's, Rusty Pelican, Joe's Crab Shack, and Pizza Nova to establish partnerships with them to allow our customers' families and friends to go and enjoy a, some food or a drink while they cheer on their families uh, as they're out there flying. This August will mark our fifth year uh, here in Newport Harbor. I hope that you can continue to be open-minded about our operation and show that we can continue to be safe and respectful neighbors in the harbor. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? How many, how many other people want to speak on this item? Why don't you come down to the front? You can come up to the podium as soon as he's done. Go ahead, sir. Uh, my name is Clarence Yoshikani, and I'm a resident of Newport Beach since 1986. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Honorable Mayor and City Council for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm coming from a, a couple different places in addition to what has already been uh, stated. Uh, my concern is uh, the safety of our children in our city uh, that are on either sailboats or paddle boards or boats or any, any uh, watercraft. Uh, I think uh, the jetpack would be great, but it needs to be in the ocean. Uh, off of Maui, North Shore of Maui, it's very successful there, but it's probably five or 10 miles from anything uh, that could affect uh, the environment as well. Um, I also just sold the property uh, off of Violito directly in front of the training basin, and I probably had 80 plus people through the property looking in you know, a prospective homeowners and a number of them had concerns about uh, the, the proposed new anchorage in that area, as well as uh, the jetpack's uh, you know, effect on their tranquil, you know, tranquility and, and uh, people buy on the harbor just you know, to get away from hectic life and so on. And uh, they felt that it would affect the property values and they declined to make an offer. So I respectfully uh, request that you object uh, to this uh, business in the harbor. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, my name is Don Cole. I live on Villalito, not the island, the street. On May 8th of this year, we sent a letter to the council signed by 146 people that only took a few days to, to acquire, asking the council to ban the jetpack operation from inside the Newport Harbor. Jetpack America waged a social campaign and at the following council meeting had numerous customers give testimonies about how great it is and how much fun they had. We don't argue that fact. The issue is whether or not it is appropriate in our harbor. And if you have listened, and if you have listened to the people who know our harbor the best to make that decision, the vast majority of people who live on or near the bay understand the negative impact. The boaters in the harbor understand the negative impact. Other users on the bay understand the negative impact. In addition, sign of our, of our letters included owners of the marine businesses, professional yacht captains of large private yachts, sail program directors, marine insurance and yacht brokers, and the owners of the two largest shipyards inside Newport Harbor. All these people understand the negative impact. All of them have firsthand knowledge of what works inside Newport Harbor and what makes it one of the jewels of our city. In addition to what the gentleman just said about the negative impact on our property values, I have an additional letter from 
an insurance and family uh, protection insurance firm. He has lived and worked in Newport Harbor since 1995. He recently moved his office onto the bay and finds the jetpack operation to be loud and disruptive. Counter to the ambience the city has worked so hard to create. He too states his concerns about the property value. Just like the police department is charged with protecting our citizens, isn't it the city council, isn't the city council charged with not only, no, I'm sorry, isn't the city council charged with not allowing things that would negatively impact our property values? Finally, the Harbor Commission understands the negative impact in the harbor. As you know, they recommended unanimously not to allow this type of operation in Newport Harbor. How can you not listen to the experts on the commission? There is now a possibility of an anchorage on the west end of Little Island, which will bring even more traffic. I don't know if any of you saw this area last Saturday, but it was very congested. Little Island Yacht Club started their summer sailing program. The Boy Scout Sea Base had kayaks out. Orange Coast College had sailing classes, plus the normal amount of boat traffic, part of boat, party boats, renters of SUPs, and kayaks. It's only, go, it's only going to get congested, more congested as summer moves on and jetpackers and their entourage are not compatible in this area or on inside the harbor. Um, I would just like to comment on what Dino Madeley said. Every time somebody from Jetpack America has gotten up here and spoke to you, they keep talking about redefining, redefining. We've been hearing this for two or three years and they're still making the same mistakes. It's, it's just something that is not compatible for our, for our harbor. They talk about the noise. It's like living two or three, well, three doors away from a weed blower going on constantly. I don't think any of you would want to live with that type of noise. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? Okay, seeing no one, I'll bring it back to council. Mayor Pro Tem Dixon. Uh, thank you, Mayor Selich. Uh, question of s staff. Um, could you clarify, Chris or Dave, the permit? Uh, we've heard a new number of comments about the tandem, the dual rider, if you could just clarify what the permit will, if the ordinance passes, what the permit would provide for or prohibit, please. Yes, the new permit or the, the updated permit after this council meeting will reflect changes that in addition to what's in the existing extended permit would, um, would curtail and just have one jetpack in the air so that there's not two in the air. Tandems would be allowed, only because I don't see a difference uh, in um, impact with um, a, an adult and a child or an adult, it's still the same machine. Um, that, that would be the updates. I would, I would emphasize clear, clearer in the permit, if I could, on rotating around the anchorage area so, or the turning basin so that not one area is impacted more than the other, and um, I, th I think that's about it. Then one other question regarding noise. I went back into the earlier staff reports. Have, have, we, have you folks ever done a noise study of the noise impact? We tried to. We, we tried to uh, near the end of last year and beginning of this year to try and do an impromptu noise study, but it was, it was hard for us to time it so that they, so that no one knew we were out there. And we went, our code enforcement staff went out five or six times and t to no luck. Um, we, then we had, prior to the first meeting on this topic a couple months ago, we attempted to coordinate with Jetpack America and due to scheduling conflicts, we, we couldn't get that done. So the, the answer to your question is no, we haven't had a certification. So we've yet. never done, we've never certified the noise levels? No, we haven't. Okay. Um, I will continue to vote no on this. I respect the uh, opinion and the studies of our Harbor Commission and the numerous residents who are immediately effect, impacted in the immediate vicinity, whether they were over on the other side at 19th Street or now over here in the Turning Basin. We're continuing to hear the same comments and the same descriptions of the noise and quality of life impact. So uh, thank you, I will be voting no, thank you. I entertain a motion. On move, the move approval of the item. Is there a second? I'll second the item. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, please vote. 
Prior to reading the vote, I'll read the ordinance title, ordinance number 2015-13, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach, regulating the lim and limiting the operation of vessels propelled by water above the surface of Newport Beach. The motion carries 4-2 with council members Piotr and Mayor Pro Tem Dixon voting no. Okay, uh, Madam Clerk. Public comments on non-agenda items. Public comments are invited on non-agenda items generally considered to be within the subject matter jurisdiction of the City Council. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes. Before speaking, please state your name for the record. Okay, this is public comments on non-agenda items. Anyone wishing to address the Council, please come forward and state your name. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council members. Uh, my name is Arthur Jeppe and I'm a long-term uh, resident of Lido Island. Uh, the subject is uh, St. John's, the uh, uh, St. James the Great Episcopal Church. I know you've heard a lot about it up to now, and I don't want to belabor the subject much longer, but I would like to just add a couple of points. Um, I realize that it uh, might be putting the cart before the horse uh, by discussing this before the developer has a chance to present the project to you, uh, but it is a critical issue that uh, will affect the community for many years. Uh, looking at a more immediate impact, uh, we are faced with a situation where St. James the Great Church is approaching the loss of its property within the next three days, uh, and that's with the uh, escrow on the sale uh, closing this week. The um, congregation has been told by uh, Bishop Bruno that um, their last service will be this Sunday. And uh, they, um, the developer has uh, not extended the opportunity for the congregation to lease back the space. So this will result in an abandoned site, a, um, a boarded up facility for years to come while the, uh, the developer tries to uh, rezone the property. Uh, I've seen how an ab abandoned building uh, on Violito and the Christian Science Church uh, deteriorated under a similar situation and became an eyesore and a blight in the neighborhood. The dilemma is that a, a church that has been on the site for over 70 years uh, a holy and consecrated ground uh, that is a special place in the Lido community that is providing important spiritual, religious, and social uh, cohesion is facing immediate destruction without the opportunity for the public consideration of the necessary rezoning. This isn't right, and I'm asking for the council to help resolve the issue in uh, any, ma any manner or means that is at their disposal. Uh, clearly, uh, that uh, clear heads can come to some uh, solution. Once again, St. James the Great Church will be uh, forced off their property in less than one week. Uh, your attention to this urgent matter will be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Piotr, did you want to speak? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I didn't have a chance to say anything about this project earlier, but the, um, I was on the planning commission when this zoning was put into place that implemented the 2006 general plan amendment. And we had long discussions on the planning commission regarding church zoning or assembly zoning. And I agree with Mr. Curry, I just wanted to say that again, uh, that, that we are going to look very close. I am going to look very close at this property and I, I feel very strongly that uh, it, church zoning is a benefit to the community and that I would, it would be difficult to convince me that, uh, that there might be a higher and better use, but I, right now my, my thoughts are that it's an important aspect or asset to the community. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Council Mayor Petros. I, I, um, I appreciate your comments and I, and I do appreciate my colleagues up here. I think you're hearing unanimity uh, about the house of worship issue, but I'd like to present to you another dilemma, maybe a different definition, and I'm gonna ask you to help me, which is unusual. Um, there is a transaction between two private parties 
the city has yet to be approached, or this body has yet to be approached to act in any way. And the dilemma is, we probably won't be for at least a year, if not more. So that issue of an abandoned building will come to pass. And it will come to pass by no action of this council. Okay? If we do nothing and allow the institutional use to remain as the zoning, the church will be gone. How to remedy that or ensure that, you, that there is an opportunity for that site to remain a house of worship and to be able to be reused again becomes the dilemma. And, and quite frankly, colleagues, I don't know. I, I have received numerous, dozens, close to 100 emails from, from individuals, and, and I understand that. When we are entertaining churches in industrial sites, in schools, in the old city hall, that's horrible. People deserve, people of faith deserve houses of worship to, to conduct their, their, their services and their worship. But how we address this issue, I have to admit, I, I don't have an answer yet. So I think it's incumbent on both of us to, to explore opportunities. And I'm, I'm delighted to hear what I'm hearing up here on the council from my colleagues. But I have to be honest with you. I feel as though my hands are tied because nothing's come before us and, and this transaction will run itself and be done without anything that we can do here regarding the removal of the church from the property. What we do with that property in the future, let's work together on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other comments on the, uh, uh, not on the, the agenda? Hi, Mike Glenn, resident of Balboa Peninsula. Uh, while this is coming up for a vote later on today uh, re in regards to the fire rings, my comment is about the, how we arrive there. The public goes through election cycles, and each one of you are elected to represent us. Your votes then instruct city staff their direction and how they should carry out your, your desires. Um, the January 13th meeting of city council had a vote by a majority of you up there to restore 60 wood-burning fire rings. Two weeks later, you approved the minutes and, in fa and said, in fact, that is what was voted on. There's no dispute after the second meeting uh, what was voted on there. Um, and what we have now is a situation where city staff has sent over to the Coastal Commission a plan that is anything but what was voted on here. Now we have public sessions so that people like myself can come up here and speak their piece and you guys can take that into consideration before your vote. But there was no alteration. There was never a subsequent vote on the January 13th, from the January 13th meeting. Now last Monday at a uh, town hall meeting, uh, Dave Kiff said that there was in fact a closed session secret meeting where nobody was invited and there was no notice to vote, which changed the vote of the January 13th meeting. If that's true, that is a violation of the Brown Act. Now I'm curious, there are three different ways that we can arrive at the situation we're in currently. One, there was in fact a secret meeting that did take place, which changed the outcome of the vote. Two, council members have been acting behind the scenes, instructing staff to do something that countermands that vote. Or three, staff is countermanding the council. And I'd like to know which one of those three we have right now. Thanks, thank you. Uh, any other public comments? Please come forward on non-agenda items. Good evening, Honorable, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Paul Mathias, and I'm a nearly three-decade property owner in Newport Beach. This city has many challenges with respect to the administration of personnel matters and the numerous lawsuits and costs related to litigation and settlements now approaching $10 million since the end of the Great Recession are symptomatic of a systemic problem. The last two months, I appeared before this body and asked the city council to seek a grand jury investigation into the improper leak of a confidential memorandum to a news reporter 
regarding an employment matter involving an assistant city manager. The memo was prepared by the city attorney and disclosed to the council during closed session at the March 17, 2015 meeting. I believe that an investigation conducted by the city attorney or any of the three direct reports to the council would be seen as biased by the public because of the inherent challenges involved. The challenges being the city attorney would be investigating the people for whom his employment is uh, incumbent upon their support. This closed session discussion suggests the entire council has seen the document by the time of the aforementioned leak. This understanding further supports my contention that an internal investigation would be problematic, look to be biased and erode public trust. There are other options other than the grand jury investigation, of course. Civil Service Board under Section 711 Part D provides that opportunity. However, all we are told from the council is there is a process being followed. At least one council member has stated his belief that all of the people who were uh, privy to the information should be polygraphed. I believe the grand jury investigation should move forward, should be authorized by this body, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Leslie Miller, I am a resident of the peninsula. Um, I would, my comments touch upon several agenda items, but I would like to just say, um, well, I, this is the time to speak to non-agenda items. Uh, well, so all right. Well, this is non-agenda. Agenda, I'll start with non-agenda. Non-agenda would be that I would urge um, a comprehensive approach to the peninsula. There's so many items that touch upon it. And for example, the Balboa Village, when I go to those meetings and I speak about parking, they don't want to hear about it because there's a parking consultant. When you go to the parking meeting, then you, I wanted to talk about the Balboa, Peninsula, Balboa Village, which is, a, in my view, a, a terribly blighted area. Uh, they don't want to hear about the beach cleanup. So we need to, to have a comprehensive approach. I don't think anyone here will dispute that the peninsula looks vastly different, feels vastly different than it did, say, 10 years, as recently as 10 years ago. Um, it, it, it's blighted by all description. Um, two adjectives would be uh, dirty and dark. Um, conducive and, and desirability would be light and clean. Uh, this last week, I found out that it's even dirtier than dirty um, because there's no water available to clean as it used to be cleaned uh, downtown once a week. So now it's, it's worse. I am thankful for the three new policemen, thanks to Diane Dixon, that are assigned. But uh, now I hear talk of drug sales in the dark shadows of Balboa Village, which is very distressing. Really, um, another thing was the uh, parking permits. Um, I went to the meeting where they were talking about parking permits in the middle of the peninsula, and it was generally announced that everybody that's affected gets to vote. And I said, well, I'm affected because the leftover, the spillover, will go down to the peninsula, down to the Balboa Peninsula Point. They said, no, you're not affected. Well, <laughs> yes, we are affected. And the only approach that I can see that would be sensible is an overall Balboa Peninsula. I went out on the beach and I, and I said, well, thank you for cleaning up. It's much better than last year just on the beach itself. The person who's been ch in charge of the uh, cleaning for the last, he told me, 30 years um, said, well, there's no longer a rake machine. I said, why isn't it pretty like it used to be with the raked feeling? And he said, well, the rake machine broke. Well, what, did you ask for another one? Because it, it just generally looks much better. He said, no, the council will never approve a new rake machine. Well, how much does that cost? <laughs> I have no idea how much that costs. But it's, it's degrading. I view it as favoritism to other areas of the peninsula. Um, 
in favor of other areas as opposed to the peninsula. We're getting all the dirt, all the darkness, all the congestion, all the uh, horrors of the uh, trash in the summer. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Mr. Mayor, Council Member, I am Reverend Cindy Voorhees from St. James the Great. Thank you for having us here today. Um, I was in Diane's uh, council um, or town meeting and spoke about the benefit of the church and all the programs we have. And uh, Councilman Petros, you asked what you could do to help, and you did tonight. Thank you for your support. Uh, there is an organization that's been formed, and today uh, Save St. James the Great uh, has filed a temporary restraining order on this process so that we can have more time to react because Bishop Bruno gave us six weeks and waited half that time before he came down and spoke to us. There has been a lot of discussion about um, how he's gone about this, and I won't get into canon law, but there is a lot of people in the diocese <coughs> and in the nation watching this. So I would just say if you could continue in your support, there's five of you that have spoken up. I hope the developer is here tonight because I used to be in construction. I actually helped build St. James the Great. I was the liturgical architect. And I know that this is very important that you voice your opinion so that maybe they will be deterred. There are, it's a huge community of people coming to St. James from all faiths. And it's an ecumenical place where people are learning music, the arts. We hold a parking lot that is being very widely used by the community with 80 spaces. Uh, we are in the process of finding more spaces for the CUP, as people know. But we are an active member of this community trying to serve the community. We're one of the last churches that sits 375 people. We are open to meetings that you may need. Uh, we are trying to be of service to this community in greater ways that in 21st century church we should be doing. We've embraced coding school. We are doing coding for schools in um, all different ages from three-year-olds up to 80-year-olds. There's just such a tremendous ministry going on. I would hate to see this but you know, disappear. But you have helped tonight, and I want you to know that people are listening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker. All right. Ladies first. My name is, I'm sorry, my name is Evelyn Croner, and I own a house on Lido, and I am a member of St. James the Great Church. You asked uh, what you can do. You can vote to affirm the 2006 plan for Lido Village, the zoning plan. That's what you could do. If you had a little vote right now, and whether that could be done without being on the agenda in advance, I don't know, but you could set a vote for the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll try and not repeat. Uh, my name is Bob Voorhees. I always introduce myself as I'm the man behind the woman. I'm married to the vicar. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak, mayor and council members. Uh, I think as citizens of Newport Beach and elected officials of Newport Beach, we all have a responsibility to be, to be wise stewards, to preserve the quality of life in Newport Beach and to preserve the resources that are available to us in Newport Beach. Um, Councilman Petros asked a great question, what can you do to stop it? I, I don't know that there's anything legally that any of you can do to stop it. We're doing what we can uh, in what we feel is an unlevel playing field, but um, we've got a pretty strong bunch of people to be able to address that. The challenge is once it's gone, it's gone. Once the transaction happens and it closes, whether it's a paved parking lot or whether it's a, a, a vacant church building, it's gonna be hard to recover that. So we will do everything within our power to preserve the sacred space and the spirit of the community. Um, I guess what we want to point out is there's a lot that we do for the community. It's not just the church and the members of the church. We host a brownie troop. We host voting when there's elections. We have holy coding to help teach people how to code and create apps. 
Uh, we host weddings, we host funerals, we host the Pacific Symphony, the Laguna Beach Corral. There's a lot of benefit in terms of community events to the residents of the community, not just the members of the church. Specific concerns. Is anybody concerned about water and the resources that we have available to us? We're all on restriction. We've got drought, more residents, more water, more challenges, more problems. Parking, traffic, all of that with more high density housing and taking away space that enhances the quality of life is a real challenge for us. We already have 23 townhomes going up next door. Safety access, our police vehicles, fire vehicles, ambulances gonna be able to get onto Lido Island and throughout the area as we make it more dense and more challenging. Most importantly, we're simply asking for a level playing field. We went to the town hall meeting that the Mayor Pro Tem Dixon hosted, uh, and, and we heard vague things. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't have an application. We really don't know what the project is. In the meantime, there's also conversation that the developer has been in multiple meetings with city officials. There's drawings. There's uh, advanced talks per the developer's quote to the Lido Island Community Association about people meeting about the outcome of the firehouse and potentially extending the, the development down there. We're already stung a little bit by an unlevel playing field and a lack of transparency by the bishop and the diocesan folks. All we're asking for is a fair shake and fair consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other speakers on non-agenda items? Come forward, please. Lady and Lords of the Royal Court, my turn to play the fool tonight. Uh, I was a little concerned about bringing a jester's hat into the chambers. I thought Duffy might tackle me and appropriate it before I made it out the door. But uh, now I'm more worried about uh, Chief Johnson, perhaps, uh, demanding the thing. I was uh, uh, Don Beatty, Balboa resident and mooring permit holder. I was at the meeting last week and spoke to you and I made two points. Uh, one point was on the, on the rate and the other was to hold a lower rate constant for uh, a number of years. I mentioned five to make up for carrying the harbor funds on the, on the back of the offshore permittees in particular uh, for the last five plus years. Uh, Outside of the meeting, since we couldn't address your comments, uh, after we made our comments and the Harbor Commission presented its report, uh, we were talking and uh, uh, some of us were concerned about the almost apparent flippant, flippant uh, acceptance of a $35 rate fee on the mooring footage per year. Uh, and. Uh, the comment was made, uh, uh, you know, don't, don't be a fool uh, and try to convince the council otherwise because they've already made up their minds. Well, you know, that figure came about and was presented by the commission for a reason. The reason was presented to you in this, the three different methods of appraisal and uh, uh, the people that, that prepared that are professionals in dealing with the statistics. There were CPAs, people that do audits. So um, my point is, I'd like you to reconsider that. Uh, I feel that the only honest comment that was made was by Mayor Selleck, who commented, and I'm going to paraphrase slightly because I can't remember exactly, uh, that the figure $35 seems to be pulled out of thin air. Well, that's not good enough. You know, you need to revisit it, reconsider it, look at the materials again, and consider that $25. You heard from people that were having difficulty uh, staying on and affording their moorings. Also, those that report can form the uh, uh, part of the reply that uh, uh, staff is going to make to the State Lands Commission that were concerned about how figures were going to be arrived at. Like I said, it was done by professionals in the field, and I think it should uh, all be considered in that light. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on non-agenda items? 
Okay, uh, we'll now move on to um, oral reports from city council members on uh, council committee activities. Council member Piotr, anything to report? No. Uh, council member Petros? No report. Mayor Pro Tem Dixon? I do. Okay. Pass by me one second. Okay, I'll go to council member Muldoon. Anything to re okay. Council member Curry? No report. Okay, I'm ready. All right, <laughs> go. Um, I'm delighted to share with you uh, some information. Uh, Ms. Leslie Miller is still here. It relates to Balboa Village. Um, on June 10th, the orange section of the American Planning Association held its 2015 Planning Awards event at Anaheim Packing House, which I attended on behalf of the city, along with Kim Brandt, Director of Community Development. The American Planning Association recognized the city's Balboa Village Revitalization Program with an award of merit in the economic planning and development category. The revitalization program includes numerous and diverse strategies related to land use planning and zoning, economic development, parking, and public realm improvements in Balboa Village. The Balboa Village Advisory Committee and city staff have put forth great effort to establish and implement these strategies, and we have already begun to see positive improvements to the village. I was honored to represent the city and support Kim and her community development team, who have successfully led the community revitalization program for Balboa Village, along with many dozens of community volunteers who cherish the past and future of Balboa Village. And so it is a pleasure to show you all what the staff has been recognized and the Balboa Village uh, Advisory Committee and the work of the citizens in the community who care so much about our community are continuing to work together to revitalize this important part of our cultural history and our future of the city to continue to be strong and vital and not use the dreaded B word, blighted, in our community because there is a great future ahead for Balboa Village. And I want to thank the Community Development Department who worked so hard to advance new ideas and creative strategies forward. So thank you, Kim, and your team. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll now move on to our public hearings. First public hearing is item number 23, award of a non-exclusive solid waste collection franchise to Genes Genesis Dispatch Incorporated. Staff? Mayor, members of the council, Mike Pisani, co-director of MOD. Um, at the last council meeting, we introduced an ordinance to consider the award of a non-exclusive solid waste collection franchise to Genesis Dispatch. Um, upon adoption of the ordinance this evening, the agreement would go into effect on July 23rd and would expire on March 1 of 2017, the same as the rest, the other um, haulers in the city. Uh, Councilmember Petros. Uh, just a question on that uh, 2017 sunset date. Um, we have been looking at these franchises and each one of them sunsets uh, in 2017. The assumption is that shortly thereafter, we will be able to then terminate all of these and look at other potential ways to address uh, this type of service, whether it be a more competitive uh, RFP process or some other. Um, is that still the case that right after March of 2017, on April 1st, we can start the process to evaluate alternatives? So uh, let me go ahead and take that, that question real quick. Under, under the Public Resources Code, if you want to move from a non-exclusive system to an exclusive system, you have to give them a five-year notice. Right. And so if that's something the council wants to consider, maybe that should be an item that you take up, whether or not to provide that notice so that you have the opportunity, but it won't be 2017 before you could move from a non-exclusive system to an exclusive system, if that's where you choose to go. Mr. Mayor, then whenever you're uh, ready to entertain a motion, I'd like to make that motion with a provision like that. Go ahead. Then I would move um, the action uh, indicated to award the non-exclusive solid waste collection franchise with uh, an amendment to for staff to return to us to initiate now or as soon as uh, feasibly feasible the process of moving from a non-exclusive to an exclusive franchise. 
Is that just for this contract or for all the contracts? For all, for all, all contracts. All the contracts. Okay. Is there a second? I second. Okay. Uh, any council discussion before I open it for public comment? Mr. Chair. Uh, Councilmember Piotr. Chair. So, staff, explain the exclusive versus non exclusive. If we do an exclusive, let's say for commercial waste, which is what this is for, right? That would mean that we'd go under contract like we are with CRNR for the residential, and they would be exclusive. You could do multiple exclusive. Um, <laughs> and the multiple contract. exclusives mean what? We'd assign an area to each vendor, and then they would do those. You could assign area, yeah, um, east or west side of the city, or you could say you're going to have two um, exclusive franchised. Um, Hollers. Then they would be semi-exclusive, I presume. Correct. But I basically, think. right now, we've got however many non-exclusive haulers, 20. And so you, as a business owner, have a choice of contracting with any one of these approved non-exclusive vendors. Correct. So if we were to make it exclusive, whether we limited it to one, two, or six, you would then be limited to one vendor or maybe two vendors instead of 20 vendors. Correct. Yeah, I would. I am adamantly against this. It it would not. Just so I'm clear, it would not be my intention to have one, two, or or a small number. The issue is we have 36, 36 or 37 of these vendors driving big trucks on our streets, uh, using up resources, emitting diesel fumes, tearing up our roads, and I think that we can still have a, an unfettered competitive market while improving, not maintaining, improving the quality of life in our neighborhoods. Okay. I'll open it for public comment. Anybody wish to comment on this item? Come forward. Okay. Seeing no one, I'll bring it back to, uh, back to council. Um, I'll be supporting the, uh, the, the motion. I don't think the intent of it is to um, get rid of the competition we have amongst the commercial haulers, so um, I'll be supporting it. Uh, please vote when the screen comes up. Mr. Mayor, any, anything, again, anything limiting this would limit the marketplace, whether you're limiting it to 30 or to 10 or to 100. Okay. Prior to reading the vote, I'll read the ordinance title for ordinance number 2015-16, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach, granting a non-exclusive solid waste franchise to Genesis Dispatch Incorporated, a California corporation, to provide solid waste collection services upon the city streets and within the City of Newport Beach. Councilmember Selich, are you? No screen. No screen. Thumbs up. Oh. With council members Piotr and Muldoon voting no, the motion carries 4-2. Okay, we'll move on to item number 24. This is provide direction to staff on further review of existing easements and conditions associated with the prior vacation of Ticonderoga Street. Mr. Webb. Yes, Mr. Mayor, council members. This is a request from council member uh, Petros to review the conditions that are existing on a vacation that was done in 1984. When Ticonderoga was vacated, we had a couple conditions, re reservations back to the city. Two particular, I think, are of interest. Uh, the ability to allow Ticonderoga to be connected to a future Bluff Road or 15th Street. I don't know if that'll ever happen, but there is a condition for that. There's also an easement reserved back to the city for a possible bike lane that goes through this area. Uh, I know those are some of the concerns, and we just want to know if you want additional discussion on this. Hey, Council Member Petros. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I brought this forward after uh, meeting with uh, the homeowners in Newport Crest and actually reviewing both uh, this resolution the city's master plan of streets and highways, the county master plan of arterial highways, and all of the forecasting that's been done for future development and future infrastructure in the county around this area. And I can say that under no circumstance is there any plan that would provide for a road that connects Ticonderoga to a future Bluff Road or 15th Street. And in fact, it, the, the whole notion of this resolution under the whereas says that Ticonderoga Street is unnecessary to present a uh, prospective public use. It's not intended to be a connection to the overall public street system. And the neighborhood of Newport Crest currently enjoys this uh, roadway as direct access to their neighborhood. 
there is no future condition where that road would ever need to be or serve a public purpose to connect to any road in the future. In fact, the application for uh, Banning Ranch actually has Bluff Road diminished from the master plan because the forecasts of traffic in this area are much less than they ever were in the future. Therefore, I'd like to suggest to my council colleagues that we don't abandon the entire resolution, but instead, if looking at the conditions under number one, there is a condition 1E that says, allow Ticonderoga Street to be extended westerly and connected to 15th Street at such time as 15th and Bluff are constructed. That that subcondition be stricken from this resolution. That I think is all I wanna to get to here because I think the other items in there about uh, indemnifying and holding harmless the city, maintaining Ticonderoga in good condition. The neighborhood does that, and I don't think they'd want to, to uh, go back on that. Uh, the notion of if there's any gates ever uh, proposed that it, would, uh, that it shouldn't come to the city, I believe that that's absolutely uh, appropriate. But the notion that Ticonderoga would ever be extended doesn't arise, and we should acknowledge that and remove that from this resolution and condition. Okay, would you like to make a motion on this item? Uh, well, what are the, the actual action is the actions to direct staff to bring it back to us, then I would uh, move the motion to direct staff to bring this back to us, uh, eliminating one E from the, uh, the overall conditions and any other sub conditions that city staff may, may consider to be satisfied. For example, the signal, I think the signals in and it's already been paid for so we can dispense with that as well. Second. Okay. Any other comments from council? Seeing none, any public comment on this item? Please come forward. Honorable Mr. Mayor, council members, my name is Leslie Rosenthal and I happen to be a resident of Newport Crest. And I'd like to give you a sort of a nightmare scenario as to what could happen if Councilman Petros is wrong and that Banning Ranch is built, which I think it probably will be, and that they look to connect Ticonderoga to Bluff Road and 15th. So imagine being an owner or lessee at Newport Crest. You live in an attractive community of 460 condos with a large swimming pool, spa, tennis courts, and quiet courtyards where children play amongst trees and landscaped areas. Suddenly, this is a little bit of magic here, suddenly Ticonderoga is extended to Banning Ranch's proposed Bluff Road. Peace no more. Number one, homes, especially those whose living areas and bedrooms back onto Ticonderoga are going to be harassed by traffic noise coming from motor vehicles either going to or coming from some of the 1,375 homes planned for Banning Ranch, not to mention the 75 hotel rooms. Number two, how about car emissions coming from all these vehicles? People will no longer be able to keep their windows open, and most of the homes at Newport Crest do not have air conditioning. Number three, Ticonderoga will not be able to accommodate all these vehicles, so the city will decide to build a two-lane road through Newport Crest, where formerly people walked their dogs, admired the trees, and visitors were able to park their cars. Traffic coming down on Superior will become even worse than it is today. Number four, idyllic Newport Crest is ruined. Owners are selling and finding the property values have dropped dramatically and finding a buyer is next to impossible. Five, assessed values consequently decrease and the county and Newport Beach receive reduced income from property taxes. So this is a nightmare and it's a bit of a, hopefully will never happen, but unfortunately for many of us living in Newport Crest, it could become a reality. Mayor, council members, please save Newport Crest and our lifestyle by abandoning the easement, permitting the extension of Ticonderoga Street into Banning Ranch. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Jenny Lombardi, and I live in Newport Crest and have lived there for 31 years. Currently, I'm on the board of directors and have been on the board for about seven years. I want to thank Councilman Petros for bringing this um, item 24 forward for discussion and consideration by the council. And thank you, Councilman Petros, for hearing our concern for our, from our homeowners meeting that you recently attended. Uh, the agreement, uh, most of what I was going to say has been said. Uh, you heard what the agreement is that we're concerned about, the extension of Ticonderoga into um, Bluff Road or 15th Street, and that is currently uh, banning ranch property. All of the streets and courtyards in Newport Crest are privately owned and maintained by the association. And as Councilman Petros uh, pointed out, we have maintained Ticonderoga for all of these years doing the repairs and slurry sealing and striping and speed bumps, everything that goes along with um, ownership of streets. Uh, given that Newport Crest has one street for ingress and egress, and that is Ticonderoga, extending the westerly end of Ticonderoga would have an extreme impact on our community and our quality of life, as was pointed out just the speaker before me. We already, already consistently address the issues of traffic, parking, and speed within our community, as does most of Newport Beach. If Ticonderoga is extended, we anticipate a large increase in these problems. However, then it would be the city's problem to deal with those issues, and uh, one of them being our stop signs along Ticonderoga, which as drivers approach them, they sometimes think they have a decision to make. Newport Crest is a walking and bicycling community, especially when accessing the amenities such as our pool, uh, jacuzzi, tennis courts, barbecues, as, and the local parks, uh, the two lovely parks that have been put in just adjacent to us, the beaches and local restaurants. Uh, when the, the agreement had something about possibly a uh, bike lane, we feel that Ticonderoga many times is just a bike lane. Uh, there are so many bicyclists on it and, and people walking. Over the years in various conversations with city representatives, each one has said that to their knowledge, there is no intention by the city to extend Ticonderoga. So we've had that uh, impression verbally over the years, and those have been in conversations uh, with the development of Sunset uh, Ridge Park. Uh, Newport Crest respectfully requests that this be the case, and we enter into a new agreement with the city to reflect that position. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, I'm Jonathan Weiner. I'm a resident of New Newport Crest. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Petros for uh, periodically attending uh, events and meetings at uh, Newport, Newport Crest, and I particularly want to thank him for keeping his ears open and listening to our community and uh, to follow through and, and uh, bring this issue uh, uh, to the council. Uh, as far as the actual issue is concerned, I think anything that would increase the traffic uh, on Ticonderoga presents a hazard uh, to the area. This is a, an area that is, uh, has a significant uh, amount of pedestrian traffic and uh, frequently the pedestrian traffic actually crosses uh, Ticonderoga to get to the uh, clubhouse area that, that's centrally located in Newport Crest. Uh, in addition to the uh, uh, fumes, the uh, noise, and uh, uh, the pollution that uh, increased traffic would create, uh, I, 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 it, this looks like a very poor idea to uh, extend uh, this this road any further. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Tom Schottmiller. Uh, our family was one of the original owners in this community in 1973. I also want to add my thanks to Councilman Petros for uh, attending our meetings and, and listening to the concerns as council members and mayor can tell. This is something of grave importance uh, to, to our group. So I just want to add that uh, we view our community as, as what we call a walkable community. If you've been in our community, you will see that there are always children walking on Ticonderoga, going to the pool, people walking their dogs, uh, riding bicycles. 
to ever uh, have that as a thoroughway would be a true tragedy in so many ways to the residents of our community, but also to the city. It would be a traffic nightmare and it would be a very dangerous situation. So we appreciate uh, the work that you've done on, on our behalf and, and look forward to a positive result. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers on this item? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back for vote. Please vote when the screen comes up. The motion carries unanimously, 6-0. Okay, the next item is item 25, appointments to boards and commissions. Um, I'll entertain a motion to continue this item to July 14th meeting to allow us to have a full city council to vote on these appointments. So move. Second. Okay, uh, anybody want to comment on this item from the public? Okay, seeing no one, uh, please vote when the screen comes up. The motion carries unanimously, 6-0. Okay, uh, next item is item number 26. This is the sculpture exhibition in Civic Center Park. Uh, Mr. Heatherton. Uh, good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Uh, tonight I'm here to uh, uh, bring before you for approval uh, the second phase of the sculpture, uh, uh, sculpture exhibition in, in the Civic Center Park uh, project. In January, city staff commenced uh, the planning of the project with uh, Arts OC and Green Public Art. Um, under the advisement of the uh, City Arts Commission uh, Sculpture Exhibition Ad Hoc Subcommittee, and a call for entry was launched. Um, a selection process was um, um, uh, set forth, and some selections were made and approved by the Arts Commission at their June meeting. Um, if approved, um, a, a, a set of 10 sculptures will go in to the Civic Center Park and join the 10 that are there. Um, they'll go in in August and stay for a two-year period, at which time they'll be rotated out. Um, before the presentation by Rick Stein of Arts OC and Rebecca Eman of Green Public Art, uh, our chair of the Arts Commission, Rita Goldberg, and uh, Commissioner Robert Smith would like to make a few comments. Mayor Selich, Council of Newport Beach. I'm Rita Goldberg, the chair of the City Arts Commission. I want to thank everybody for their support of the sculptures. We're very excited about phase two of our sculpture garden. And I wanted to just speak a little bit about the opportunities that this sculpture garden will present for the benefit of the community. Um, we have a lot of exciting programming ideas that are being very well received in the community. We have interest from the schools for field trips docent tour-led field trips for the grade schoolers to examine the sculptures and learn about them and speak to members of the city about the arts and even conduct their own art project. We have um, opportunities for members of the business community from Fashion Island to come over with their sack lunches during lunch hour and enjoy the sculpture garden, which we would like to complement with music or like guitarists or something of that nature. There's a lot of fun and exciting programs on the horizon that will complement this. And I think that the community will greatly benefit from phase two. Um, we also expect a lot more tourists to come to this. It will be heavily promoted as a tourist attraction. It's already received a lot of great momentum just from phase one. The 6,000 pieces of literature that were printed by the uh, city of Newport Beach are all gone, all the brochures and rack cards. Um, we have over 600 people that signed up for the app, which is the self-directed docent tour and the, our volunteers, the Arts uh, Foundation members, have been leading successful docent tours as well. So I just wanna thank you for your support. We're very excited to see all the possibilities come to fruition with this new installation. I'd like to introduce my co-commissioner, Robert Smith, to speak a little bit more about the details.
Good evening, Mayor Selich and council members. It's just a little over a year ago that I stood before the council with our first uh, sculpture in the park exhibition, which was installed last August and unveiled last September. And uh, <clears throat> it's received an awful lot of favorable attention. I will leave with the city clerk, uh, Orange Coast Magazine Premier OC, which is their spring summer edition where they talk about performing in visual arts in, in Orange County. And I was very pleased to see when they talk about places to view sculpture in our whole county, they list two places. One is the California scenario, which has been long established, 33 years, by uh, Noguchi over there on Anton Boulevard. And the second one is our sculpture exhibition here in the Civic Center, which isn't even a year old. And uh, I think when we add 10 more sculpture, it will make it a much more attractive place for residents and citizens to visit. Uh, with your approval, we will install them in August and they will be unveiled at uh, uh, an event on September 12th, very much like we did last year where the artist attended and many of you who were on the council then did and hundreds and hundreds of our fellow residents did. Uh, the Arts Commission in San Diego has kind of an interesting slogan. They say, vibrant culture, vibrant city. And I think this is a way of establishing that vibrancy. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, Arts OC and Green Arts Consultancy to give you the formal presentation of the 10 sculptures we selected as finalists and four alternates which were approved unanimously by the uh, Arts Commission our last meeting. And if you have any questions at the end, myself or uh, Arts OC would be glad to answer them. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Robert and Rita. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. I'm Richard Stein, and I'm the executive director of Arts Orange County. We're the 20-year-old uh, nonprofit countywide arts council, and we're designated as the official local arts agency of the, by the county board of supervisors. Um, we work closely with municipalities, local arts organizations, provide a number of art services, and we've had the pleasure and privilege of working with the city of Newport Beach uh, on the first phase of the sculpture exhibition and also on uh, last year's Master Arts and Culture Plan, which I know you're familiar with. Um, I'm uh, accompanied this evening by my distinguished coll colleague, uh, Rebecca Eman of Green Public Art. And uh, uh, Rebecca will walk us through a description of the individual pieces of sculpture. Uh, but I do want to give you a little bit of a background as to the process by which they were selected. Uh, so let's make sure. There we go. OK, so uh, we opened a call for artists in March with a May uh, deadline for submissions. Uh, requests for proposals were disseminated far and wide throughout the arts field. And uh, we had 81 submissions, uh, not only from 43 states, but two foreign countries. Uh, 43 were from California. We had eight from Orange County and one from Newport Beach. Uh, the initial uh, selection of finalists was done online by our judging panel, which then met in May and selected the 10 uh, recommended selections as well as four alternates. Then the Arts Commission met a couple of weeks ago and approved 10 works to recommend to you. Uh, the judges included three arts commissioners, uh, the chair, Rita Goldberg, uh, Robert Smith, the chair of the subcommittee, and Charles Ware. Additionally, we had three outside experts, Julie Perlin Lee from the Bowers Museum. She's the vice president of collections and exhibition development there. Uh, Joe Lewis, uh, who uh, was just most recently Dean of the School of the Arts at UC Irvine and is a professor of art there. And Todd DeShield Smith, uh, the relatively new director of the Orange County Museum of Art here in Newport Beach. Um, the selection criteria uh, uh, were detailed, uh, artistic merit being number one. Uh, but being that this is an outdoor exhibition, the durability of the work is essential uh, and the practicality of its installation and the appropriateness to the site. And I won't read all of those individual items. 
So uh, just to give you a brief overview before Rebecca comes up and joins me, uh, the works recommended by the panel uh, and approved by the City Arts Commission really have something for everyone in it. Uh, there are works that are colorful and fun. There are uh, works for all ages. Uh, there are works that reflect the natural habitat and get people talking about the natural habitat with flowers and wildlife uh, depicted. Uh, the uh, works include decorative elements that help just animate the park and uh, make it uh, uh, more uh, inspiring. And uh, also there are works that echo the architecture of the Civic Center building and the City Council. Uh, and uh, finally, there's one that's my favorite, which celebrates the nautical heritage of a community like Newport Beach. So uh, Rebecca, please come up and uh, I'll help you out here. Thank you. Good evening. Um, nice to see some of you all again. Uh, it's great to be repeating this exhibition um, with partnership with Arts Orange County. My name is Rebecca Eman. I'm the founder and principal of Green Public Art Consultancy. So I get the pleasure of sharing all of the works and telling you just a short sni uh, snippet about each piece. First piece is by Warren Teketin. Warren Teketin has worked on a number of installations, including the Big Dig project in Boston. This project is the most adventurous of the public art pieces he has been involved with. Le Cage of Foll takes inspiration from cages, follies, and the nomadic Mongolian yurt. The work explores the craft of pipe bending, computational procedures, and fields of linear strands in which each element becomes a participant with numerous roles to play. Le Cage has also been treated with a tenemic architectural coating to reduce the effects of rusting. The work will be sited along the entry drive to the car park for City Hall. We like that the color and linear aspects of the work will complement the architecture nearby. And the sculpture is interactive, inviting visitors to the park to climb into the artwork. William Bennett is a self-described dreamer from Bergen County, New Jersey. <coughs> Since 1979, he has been creating and teaching sculpture at the University of Virginia, Charlottesville. Loomings is a sculpture inspired by the great American novel Moby Dick and refers to a chapter alluding to events just over the horizon. A steel, wood and a steel and wood hybrid sculpture, part boat, plane, animal, and sleigh, carries a large 19th century cast iron bell, a small dark horse, and floats over a symbolic dark sea. The mast, attached to the bell, rises and points to the sky. The structure tracks the seasons and points to the setting sun. A forked flag describes the wind, and a seat invites a participant to interact with the artwork. The handle on the small steel house allows the participant to open the hinged roof to reveal that it contains a note with a quote from the novel, which are offered as a gift to the participant. The work has previously been exhibited in public parks along the New York City waterfront, the Whaling Museum in Massachusetts, and most recently in Key West, Florida. This piece is sited in the middle of the lower park along the walking path and will be visible from the entry drive. Excuse me for one second. Oh, when are we going to discuss the items? At the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you. Jared Charzewski has numerous indoor and outdoor public art installations, gallery-oriented works, and currently teaches sculpture at the College of Charleston in Charleston, South Carolina. Sean Mueller, a student at the college, worked closely with Pro Professor Charzewski in the design and creation of this piece. Charzewski's work is designed to evoke a viewer's inherent connection to preservation by exploring objects and their ability to be tethered to emotional attachments and the resulting inability to throw things away. The sculpture is primarily composed of repurposed bike chain rings and, and is a little over four feet in diameter. The work will be sited at the primary entrance to the dog park. If one word had to be chosen to describe the collaborative works of Indiana-based artist team Luke Crawley and Quincy Owens, it would be interdependence. 
Owens, an abstract painter, creates vibrant works that embody a playful and energetic movement unique to his own aesthetic. Crawley, a high school science, science and math teacher, is primarily a sound artist and fabricator who is interested in dissecting and rearranging segments of sound into new systems. Prime commonality represents the ancestral commonality between humans and chimpanzees, which is undeniable with dramatic evidence exhibited in our chromosomal similarities. Each pillar is seven feet high and is styled to represent human and chimpanzee chromosomal banding using panels of aluminum and translucent acrylic. The artwork also has a light and sound component that will not be activated for this exhibition. Three pillars will be installed along the northern side around the stairwell at the very top of the park. Oakland-based artist Grant Irish focuses much of his work on bronze sculptures that investigate the relationship of instinct, imagination, and normative thought, as well as our ten tendency to live increasingly in our minds, disconnected from nature. Decline is part of a larger series that was conceived when the artist was confronted with discarded fragments of machinery along Kauai's North Shore. In the artist's words, iron cogs that powered nations transformed into benign treasures, their original intent lost to the rock, sun, and sea. Touching the skeleton of a gear embedded in lava, I wondered what fossils of the hardware that process data in this age will be left for someone in the future to discover. Fabricated from Corten steel and measuring 15 feet long, it is sited at the top of the lower park's entry stair. California wind artist Patricia Vader creates metal sculpture, functional art, murals, and portraits. She strives to make art that is imaginative, exciting, and filled with motion. She has outdoor public sculptures installed in cities throughout the western United States, Colorado, Texas, and Canada. Sunflower is a wind-driven kinetic metal sculpture that supports eight windmills, representing the petals and heart of the flower. The windmills are custom-made bicycle wheels with powder-coated aluminum discs, and they spin in different directions, clock and counterclockwise, at any given time. We have cited this piece below the overlook, which will offer visitors a great opportunity to view the work from the pathway as well as from above. Tim Little is a self-taught artist who found his passion for sculpture later in life. Little finds inspiration in what some may call junk. He will start with a pile of discarded parts and begin welding pieces together. Soon, pistons become horse parts, bicycle chains become weeping willow strands, and motorcycle tanks become a rhinoceros. In this case, Mama Cresty is made of a 50s Chevy hood and grill with 18 Harley motorcycle mufflers. This 11-foot wide sculpture has been exhibited widely in Utah where the artist resides and was selected as the overall winner at the Utah State Fair in 2012. This whimsical crustacean will surely delight and inspire both children and adults alike. Orange County-based artist Diana Marcasinas grew up in Delaware surrounded by trees and water. After moving to California for graduate school, the artist found herself drawn to crafting trees in a subconscious effort to recreate the landscape near where she grew up. The three saplings provide shelter as well as a resting place for natural wildlife. Made from recycled steel, the saplings have been previously exhibited in, exhibited in both indoor and outdoor public settings, including the LA County Arboretum, Cypress College, Q Art Salon, and currently the Tustin Marketplace. The work began as a gesture drawing a quick framework, noting the foundation for a much larger sought after organic form. They intend to leave the viewer wanting more. These pieces will be installed along the sloped hillside adjacent to the parking area at the park's entrance. Bertel Peterson focuses on simplifying materials and structures down to an essence of balance, gravity, and the perception of motion in space. This 400 pound artwork measures six feet high and is intended to be a minimal visual element in an otherwise busy visual environment. 
His choice of steel as the primary material for this artwork is that it is relatively mobile while easy to maintain. This work will be sited in the upper park and will be best viewed from the nearby outdoor seating area. And the final piece in this year's exhibition is uh, by LT Mustard Seed. LT Mustard Seed is a veteran of Desert Storm and self-taught artist. She works with various types of metals and when appropriate, recycles everyday objects into bold, colorful, and playful sculptures. Her use of machinery and custom paint finishes honor the traditions of past generations, as well as creating unique works of art that represent our own time and place. Demoiselle is a 27 foot long representation of a damselfly, a native species to California, which is similar to a dragonfly, but with a slimmer torso. We present um, our alternates selections in the event that any of the original 10 are unable to be included in the exhibition. Um, we have selected four alternates that we also would like approval. Thank you. Okay, does that conclude the, uh, the presentation? It does. Okay, uh, Councilmember Muldoon, you have a question. Yes, thank you. Very nice presentation. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, one of my concerns to my colleagues is looming. It's based on Moby Dick, and it looks like it's a looming danger for, uh, other, for other people other than just Ishmael. We've got concerns about children playing on or near it, and uh, would like to request that it be replaceable in the alternatives. Okay. Any other council comments at this time? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll open it up for public comment. So please come forward. Mayor, council members, my name is John Anderson. And I think you have a copy of my little notes in your packet. I'll read them. The city of Newport Beach is to be committed on its adoption and implementation of a comprehensive arts and culture plan, an important part of which is the Civic Center Sculpture Garden, a noble effort. However, speaking as a longtime resident, not as an expert art critic, I must regretfully offer some strongly felt cautionary personal opinions and a few hopefully constructive opinions and options. My opinions. As restored, the Civic Center Park offers a naturalistic setting as a pleasant, passive, recreational, and aesthetic counterpoint to the dynamic surrounding urban environment. They contrast and complement each other. However, as implemented, the sculpture garden creates a visual hodgepodge, a chaotic junkyard, please forgive me, but that's how I see it, which diminishes the aesthetic value of both the individual sculptures themselves and the nature-like park setting in which they are placed. Even more sculptures in this already cluttered environment would be ludicrous overkill in the extreme and likely elicit strong civic cultural backlash and further focus attention on fiscal implications. Each of these sculptures, the ones that are there now and the ones that we have seen tonight, certainly have merit. But that merit is diminished greatly as presently cited. Yet, each sculptor and its respective environment would be mutually enhanced if placed in a more aesthetically fitting site. I noticed that several of the sculptures here were set off to themselves in a specific urban site, as opposed to be putting in a naturalistic area. This is an observation. Options. Well, in substantial conformance with the adopted art and culture plan, one, consider a strategy to place and enjoy such sculptural elements in more suitable key points, public and private settings, distributed citywide. Two, explore a public-private partnership to fund and enrich such a multi-locale program. There's a lot of private art scattered throughout the Fashion Island area. Some of it I think is quite good, and it certainly fits their particular environments. Actively encourage community input and participation. <clears throat> 
as to candidate sites, designs, and uses. One of the things I think it just came to me as I was listening to the presentation, wouldn't it be great if we had a kid's interactive sculptural garment uh, uh, area where they do the sculpture and their sculpture is on display and recognized even for a short time? I think that would uh, provide for a greater community tie-in. Certainly maintain and enhance the past of recreational, environmental, and educational aspects of the existing Civic Center Park as a naturalistic area of urban relief offering its own intrinsic value. In the existing sculpture garden, consider high quality sculptural subjects, forms, and materials more in keeping with the residual naturalistic environment. Sometimes a whisper is more commanding than a shout. Thank you for your encouragement of the arts and for considering these well-met opinions and options. Thank you. Uh, yes, good evening, Mayor and Council members. My name is George Schroeder. Um, I just want to uh, rise to support the project and the concept. Uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of detractors choosing individual pieces of art, calling it junk and things like that. Um, any art is subjective, and there are things I like and things I don't like, but I do think that the concept is a good concept. It is the right location. I come to the park on weekends. There are young families here. I do have some of the concerns that uh, Councilman Muldoon has about you know ch children on some of these sculptures, like the first one, Oscar La Falls, whatever it is, my French isn't very good. Looking at that as a landlord, every time I put up a place for rent, I'm always concerned that the railings in my stairs are the appropriate space if they're too far and the kid gets his head stuck in, I can lose a lawsuit. So looking at that and having the kids climb through that, are they gonna get their hands stuck? But I'm sure the Arts Commission and the artist and everybody else has done their job and these things have been installed other places. Uh, the ones we have now, I even had concerns two years ago that young kids would climb on them and fall off. Well, it's been here, what, two years now and I don't think we've had any lawsuits, so I'm just going to defer to the judgment of the Arts Commission. Uh, this batch seemed a little bit more fun. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be some controversy because there, there will be some people who want to detract and take some pot shots and let them. Uh, like I said, art is very subjective. That's why we have different ones. I think this is a good place for it because, as I said, this space does get used a lot on the weekend, so I want to thank the Arts Commission and for this, and I think it's a nice addition. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. My name is Barry Allen, and I'm probably in the minority because everybody seems to love the Art Commission and love the art. Uh, I want to congratulate the city for the relatively low cost of the entire project. From reading the staff report that recommends you approve this, I noticed it was authored by the Library Services Director, and I must admit I didn't realize that Mr. Etherton was an expert on art. But from his ringing endorsement of uh, the art and the part, I guess somebody thinks he is. I'm certainly in the minority. I am sure when uh, I question his expertise, when I looked at the selection of staff report recommends, the report says in its environmental review that our approval of these works of art will not cause physical change. It will, uh, will, it will not cause any physical changes, but it does one thing. It will cause physical changes, but it's going to increase the ugliness component of the park by looking at these junk pieces of art that are being recommended by these alleged experts because we even had them tell us that people go select junk to put together to make art. You know, why don't we get some art that someone spends some time with, like La Cage Fa, that's, that's a wonderful piece of art and a wonderful sculpture. But I mean, these other things, I'm not going to talk about every item because I haven't got that much time. But I noticed two items, sunflower, which I find OK, and recycled. I think have bicycle gears and bicycle metal rims as very prominent features. Well, I believe this will please Councilperson Mr. Petros because it only costs $3,000 or <coughs> yeah, $3,800, and they weren't going to pay him $3,000 to put it in. So I'm saying we take it for $3,000 or $3,800. And at the end of two years, we give it to Tony for all his hard work on the council, and he can locate it somewhere else in the city. And all it's going to do is cost us $800 more. The next one is decline. Decline, I think I'm going to join with something Mr. Muldoon would probably echo, maybe even your city attorney. 
The client is really a great piece of junk that kids can walk on and fall off and cut their little bones with all the sharp pointed angles made of steel. He may be a bronze artist or something that the lady described, but this is made of steel and it has lots of sharp corners and edges. Just look at the picture again. Uh, I suggest as an old personal injury defense lawyer that if you put this thing up, you better put up some big signs and tell people to stay off it because it's dangerous and you maybe even better put up a fence because if you don't, then the first kid who gets hurt will cause a decline, to satisfy the name, in the city's budget because this art piece of art is indefensible. Placed where it is, where children are right next to a walking, children are right next to a walking path. The desire to climb on it, what the law calls attractive nuisance, besides it's ugly and doesn't deserve to be in our park. Mama Krusty, oh my God, how anybody can describe this as being whimsical. This is hideous. It is beastly. It is scary looking. This is the worst so far in this entire group. No question about it. Uh, they got to replace it with something else. The bunnies are cuddly and cute. Oh, come on. Let me finish. All right. <laughs> bunnies are cute and cuddly. This is just plain ugly and scary. And small children and even sensitive adults are going to have nightmares. <laughs> and Demisol, this is clearly a shiny blue-winged flying bug who says this is art in the park. It's an ugly piece of junk that looks like some scary creature. If you're going to replace anything, some of them, I th suggest you send them back to get something that looks like something. How about an animal or a, or a human that looks like a human or an animal? And last but not least, I do suggest one item that's in the alternatives that I think looks pretty nice. It's the orange slices. And after all, <laughs> folks, we live in Orange County. And it does look like orange slices. It does. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Barry. Next speaker, please. Uh, hello. I, I would certainly support the first speaker. The last one I do have empathy for because I was in the position of turning down a firefly with a, with a saddle on it because you, an attorney really does need to participate in the uh, selection of, of projects for the reasons stated. Um, but I, moreover, um, I note, and I would like the council to note, that most of the photos were of pieces that were on um, a beach, in a city, in, a, in a, uh, a public, a place where the public could participate. Here I notice that the um, sculpture garden, as uh, well-planned and conceived as it is, is more or less like going into a museum and people select and decide to enter the museum and for good, bad, whatever. Uh, public art, the concept as I understand it is to involve the public, criticism, liking, disliking, comedy, whatever. It's to engage the mind of the public and of the citizens of the city. For example, um, uh, Councilman Petras, I remember when I suggested that the Art Commission have some sort of uh, overview on the renovation of the village, and that was fat, flatly turned down. If, if the commission were able to select a suitable sculpture, maybe one of the ones that they've already selected, to go into the village or to go in to enliven and enrich the area by the piers, it could enhance the cultural value of the city and bring the city together and engage all the components of the city and not be a divisive um, factor. I saw in the write-up that the uh, city manager did that some of the sculptures perhaps were intended, I'm not sure, for uh, Fashion Island or for the uh, northern east, northeast part of the city. And I would just urge that there be an inclusiveness and uh, that be spread wide, far and wide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other speakers? Please come forward. Good evening. I am Lila Crispin, and I am an art expert. Unlike some of the previous speakers, I'm also a citizen of this <clears throat> community for over 40 years. I really want to commend all of you for being risk takers and for putting before the public art that can be discussed and that can be aroused as far as public interest is concerned. There is no way that you as a governing body 
will be able to choose art that every single person in this room will like. Consider yourselves experts as well, because you've done a wonderful job in choosing the people on your arts commission. There are people on your council who approve of this art, and they are to be commended as well. You have given us something that Newport Beach has never had prior to your sculpture park, and that is a direct inroad into the culture that constitutes 21st century thinking. Personally, I thank each of you, whether you like the art or whether you hate it. You are discussing it, you are hearing citizens discuss it, and hey, in a country as free and as good as ours, is there anything better than that? I don't think so. Thank you, each and every one of you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Baldoon, do you have a comment? Oh, okay. Okay, any, uh, any other speakers? Come forward, please. Hi, my name is Carmen Smith. I'm the president of the Newport Beach Arts Foundation, and I just want to thank each and every one of you and your predecessors on the prior council for putting together the, uh, well, for approving putting the uh, sculpture pieces in the park. I've had the privilege of conducting several tours now from citizens here in Newport Beach, young and old, and they all are thrilled. They actually are surprised at how much more they come to the park after they've seen the sculptures one time. They then come back and they feel like, I can explain this and I'm gonna tell my friends what this is about. And then they do. And they come back and they have a very, very nice time. And so I really do hope that you can continue with this project for many, many years. No, we're not all gonna like every piece. That's for sure. I don't like every piece. But I can still explain the thinking process that the artists had when they created the piece, and that's really all we can do. I don't like uh, Richard Serra either, and he's really, really famous and makes a lot of money, and we couldn't possibly afford to have his work. But, you know, that's the way art is. So thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening. I'm Joy Brenner from Corona Del Mar, and... Um, in 1961, my parents made me move to Corona Del Mar, and I didn't like it. But when we came over the hill on MacArthur and saw the view of the ocean from that hilltop, I had to admit it was a pretty magnificent place. And I, I called that view from that hilltop God's masterpiece. And quite honestly, I think we've done a pretty good job of mucking that up with a variety of things where when you come over the hill now, you don't really look at the view of the ocean. You look at the green parking garage, you look at the, at the city council chamber, you look at a variety of things, but you don't really look at the ocean very much. I love public art. When we travel all over the world, we always take pictures of public art, and one of my favorites was on Lake Majore, in the little town of Streza, and we walked along that bank, and we came to a metal sculpture of the American flag. And the inscription below said, to the citizens of the United States, from the citizens of Streza, in honor of, you know what? And so, um, you know, that made an impression on me. It said to me, those people cared about 9-11 in our country. They had a heart for what we'd been through. It told me something about those people. Well, when I look at the art here, it doesn't tell me anything about the people of Newport Beach. It's whimsical, I like some of it, I really do. And I agree with um, the lady from the peninsula that, you know, if you had Pretty Boy in a location that was surrounded by other things that were not art, I would look at him and I'd think he's really cute, I really do like him. But that's, that's not what I'm seeing up here. What I'm seeing up here is not cohesive. It's not, it doesn't blend together. It's so, I mean, my neighbors and friends do refer to it as the Newport Beach junkyard. And Barry's not alone. I mean, there are so many people in this community that feel that way about it. I know you've probably made up your own your minds already about this, but I feel like it has to be said because I get so tired of hearing people complain to me and hearing my son-in-law and, and my daughters say, don't go down there, it's not gonna make any difference, they're not gonna listen to you. 
And I, and I don't believe that. So I keep showing up and telling you what my friends and neighbors are saying. My criteria for this sculpture garden would be, is it local art? Is it a local theme? Is it about something that we need to be thinking about that's going to really expand our consciousness? And the other thing is presentation. You've all been to the Academia. You've all turned that corner and walked down that hallway of sculptures by Michelangelo. And as you walk down that corridor, you get closer and closer to David until it opens up and there he is in all his majesty. That's presentation. That means something. And it's not even if you love Michelangelo or David. It's like how it's put together so that when you get there, you're impressed. And I think some of these pieces could be impressive in their own way if they were presented in a different way. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? Okay, seeing no one, I'll close the uh, public portion. Uh, Councilmember Muldoon. Thank you. I had misspoke. It's Abe Hab who gets uh, the bad ending at Moby Dick. And the structure lo looming actually looks like it has a spear in it, a uh, harpoon. So. Um, in all seriousness, I do have concerns about looming. I'm not sure about the cage. I don't know how that's going to work with children and um, the large um, <clears throat> fly. I realize art is subjective. I'm not here to micromanage art commission. We disagree on what art is sometimes, um, but my concerns, I think, are, are based on real legal problems we could be facing for liability. It is an attractive nuisance for children, and um, I think all, appropriately, all four alternatives are much more safe. Um, in my opinion. So I don't know if Ms. Harp, you want to chime in or how this would affect our insurance, but uh, those, those are my concerns. Well, I think there are, you know, there are always issues with public property and, and liability issues. I think that uh, Mr. Allen had a good idea, but maybe we should take a look at our signage program as far as what art you know, that, you know, how you're uh, presenting that to the public and whether people should be able to climb on it or not and take a look at those type of liability issues. Okay. Council Member Piotr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Tim, we've got a, in the staff report, we show that it's 42000 for the artists, and basically that it's an honorarium that helps them pay for moving it here, moving it out. But you didn't include the cost by display to do the installation or our consultant costs to come up with our recommendations and reports. Can you tell us what those costs? Uh, the consultant cost is just under $80,000, and, and from the consultant's cost, they contract um, Dave Apley of Display to do the installation. So that's so the, that, that includes both items then? That includes both items, So the, the true cost for these 10 sculptures is more in the $120,000 range than the, just the 42 for the actual honorariums? Well, the total price of the project is in the $120,000 range. Okay, and when we approve these things, one of the things that we try to emphasize is that we're going to try and transition to private funding or at least try and get half of the cost of this private funding. Uh, and the idea was is that these 10 sculptures go in, they're already part of last year's budget that the previous council approved, but that next year's budget, the 215-216 budget, the 10 that are gonna go away out there and be replaced would be privately funded. The commission is geared towards that. I don't know if you want to answer it or if Rita or one, uh, the Arts Commission wants to answer that, but I just want to emphasize the importance in transitioning to that private partnership because as we've seen tonight, people have their favorites. People don't like some things, like other things, and if it's privately funded, it's less of an issue. Uh, I can say, uh, not speaking for the Arts Commission, but I know there's interest among the commission to move towards that model in the future. Okay. No, just sit down, please. Councilmember Curry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it is with a certain amount of irony that I recall that when we approved the sculpture for the Centennial Memorial down uh, on the peninsula, which is, as many of you know, a, gle a green globe that looks historically at the city's history, we had public comments that came and told us that if it wasn't a sailboat, it couldn't possibly be a representation of the city of Newport Beach. And so it's interesting that the one sculpture that draws uh, a concern is the one that's designed to be emblematic of a sailboat. Uh, I, I think Mr. Harp has a good idea to, and I think Mr. Muldoon has some legitimate concerns, uh, of finding, of looking at these from a liability perspective and looking at signage to see if any of them in fact do create a liability. If they are, then to substitute one of the 
one of the options. But, you know, I don't like all of them. Uh, I like some of them. Uh, but that's what art is about. And Lord knows you don't want me being the guy who picks art uh, for the city because it would all, uh, you know, I've got the uh, emblematic poker playing presidents on the wall, which is derivative of the poker playing dogs. So that speaks to my art, uh, my art uh, talent, I suppose. So I want to just congratulate the commission and the foundation and the community and our consultants who have come together once again to bring us, I think, a, a very uh, impressive uh, array of sculpture that I think is going to enhance our community. It's going to create uh, discussion. And for those who don't like it in two years, there'll be an entirely different group out there. I would note that the council has not taken any formal action on any 50-50 plan. So that's yet to be determined as we go through the budget. But I think we're off to uh, another good start. And uh, I would move uh, approval of the item. I'll second that. OK, uh, Cal uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Dixon. I just want to. Um Thank you, Mayor. I just want to uh, emphasize again comments I've made in earlier sessions and what Councilman Piotr spoke a moment ago. I'm a strong advocate of public-private partnerships. I think it in strengthens communities. It brings communities together. And it takes the politics out of these matters. Uh, and it really does enrich the community spirit of the community supporting uh, important functions such as art. So I would like to see. Uh, as we go forward, that the uh, community, or the Arts Commission, work with the community to uh, launch an exciting program of community involvement uh, to carry the arts program further with uh, the ownership of the community on public property. I think it would be a wonderful combination. So thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, Council Member Piotr. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. I'd like to propose an amendment, as Mr. Curry indicated, we don't have it in the budget yet. I would like to add or propose an amendment to the motion that there would be a goal to have the next 10 sculptures be privately funded by at least 50%. Mr. City Attorney, is that motion in order given the agenda of item here today? I don't really. I don't believe that that was an item that's that's really properly noticed. I mean, that's something we could bring bring back. Actually, all I'm asking for is a goal. We're not make, the budget item as an adjustment would have to come back. Well, Councilmember Carter, can I make a suggestion? I think the goal tonight is to focus on this. I think there's a broader discussion on on the on the whole funding of public art that we ought to thoughtfully discuss at a separate meeting. And, and frankly, I thought we had already discussed that, that that was an important goal that was going to be implemented. Well, we had, we had had some discussion on it. We never really came to any resolution on it. I think it's something that needs some good discussion. So, I mean, I, that's, that's my suggestion. You're certainly free to make your amendment and see if you can get a second on it. But um, I think it would be more advisable if we did a, had a thoughtful discussion of this item and not just do it on the fly here tonight. I kind of look at the two as being interwoven for my support tonight. Okay, is there a second to the amendment? Okay, dies for lack of a second. Councilmember Petros. Yeah, I just uh, will uh, register my support for the motion and to thank the Arts Commission for their good work. Again, uh, uh, art is very subjective. Um, I would point out to Barry, thank you for that generous offer. While uh, each of the bicycles in my collection uh, is much more valuable than that 3,800. I would gladly take that uh, sculpture because I do think it's very beautiful. So, okay, uh, Councilmember Muldoon. Yeah. So just to uh, hold feet to the fire here, looking at looming especially, uh, do I have to put offer an amendment, looking at that from a risk management aspect? Or if, if you if you definitely would like it replaced, you probably should make an amendment to okay. replace it with one of, one of the alternatives. I don't know. If, an amendment. Yeah, if my colleagues could look at this, it's got three pointy ends on it. It's got some sort of uh, uncruel punishment mechanism on the top. I mean, this thing looks like. Yeah, but it's but a it's a sailboat. Yeah, I. I mean, we could rope it off. We could install ropes around it to make it more difficult to make sure it's clear not to get on it, but. That's about I, I always w worry when attorneys start selecting art. Yeah, well, I'm I, definitely not an artist. Uh, yeah. Councilmember Muldoon, can I can I make a suggestion that uh, you know that we let the staff evaluate the best way to deal with the risk aspect of it, and if they feel it's risky, they can 
Sure, yeah, Actors yeah, that's sort of substitution. Yeah, leeway makes sense, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Wait, Let's sorry, just... I missed that, Mr. Mayor. Sir, so you're are you really authorizing the staff to make the substitutions from no. the list? No. 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 So if we you bring if that you, back to you. If you feel you. that you can't adequately address a risk, if a risk exists, then you bring it back to us for consideration okay. of one of the alternates. Okay, great. Thank I would you. agree to that, too. Yeah. I think that's fair. And I don't think we need a motion for that. Our... Let's keep the motion simple right. so we know what's going on here tonight. Okay, um, I just have a, I have a couple of comments I'd like to make since everyone else is, it seems to be done here. Scott, did you <laughs> want to say something else? Until after you're done. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a little bit of a concern that I'd, that I'd like to express. I think that we need to have a little bit more public outreach in the process that the Arts Commission goes through on this. I think, um, you know, art is um, something that uh, a lot of people react differently to. Um, I don't think any of us up here on the council want to be art critics, but I do think we need to get more community exposure to the pieces that we're selecting. I've said this before last year when we did the first phase of this, that this is a rotating exhibition where every year 10 will come in, 10 will go out, and ultimately it will reflect the values of this community by the public participation. But I think that in, in my estimation, just looking at the process that was presented to us, we just need a little bit more outreach with the public on this to get uh, more exposure so we get more community buy-in and that it is, uh, not everyone's gonna like it, but, uh, but there is more exposure to it and we have a, have a more open process on that part of it. Um, so uh, that's my suggestion. Um, I'm not making part of a motion or anything, but just an, an opinion I'd like to express and hopefully the commission will take it into uh, consideration. So if there's no further uh, discussion, I'll call for the vote. Actually, I did have a request to speak. Okay, go I have ahead. Just a statement like you were suggesting. I'll support this tonight because I've talked to a lot of the arts commissioners and they've all indicated that they look forward to, to uh, trying to do a private partner, private public partnership and try and privatize some of this, uh, even though I don't have any kind of assurance that it's going to be discussed up here. Uh, but I would like to address that down the road. Well, I think we will and we should. I mean, I know the Arts Commission is, is taking that approach, but I think we need to give them some direction and a formal vote from the councils because I think there's probably a little bit of confusion as to exactly what our policy is. So, you know, a separate agenda item would be good. So, uh, please vote. The motion carries unanimously, 6-0. Okay, we'll move on to um, item number 27. This is the donation of the sculpture from the Ben Carlson Memorial Foundation. Uh, staff, who's doing the presentation? Uh, Tim? Good, uh, good, good, good evening again, uh, Mayor Selich and members of the council. Last fall, uh, the Ben Carlson Foundation approached the Arts Commission about donating a statue in memory of Ben uh, to the city. At their March meeting, uh, the Arts Commission, uh, they uh, recommended that, uh, that it should be taken to council for approval. Um, part of that recommendation was that um, council policy B11 be uh, waived because a coastal site for the statue is perhaps more appropriate. Um, finally, in June of 2015, um, the Arts Commission recommended uh, the base of the Newport Pier as an appropriate site for the statue. Now with us tonight is um, Jake Jans of the Ben Carlson uh, a Foundation who will do a presentation on the statue and the project itself. So I'd like to turn it over to Jake at this time. Thank you. Good evening. Hello, Council, and thank you for having us here tonight. Um, my name is Jake Jans. I am Ben Carlson, the lifeguard here of Newport Beach's uh, brother-in-law, and uh, I'm here on behalf of the Carlson family and the Ben Carlson Foundation. Um, we're gathered tonight to discuss the most meaningful piece of public artwork that I'd like to explain the story of and the significance behind. Um, overhead, you see a, a short video clip. Tim, would you mind running?
It was nearly one year ago on July 6, 2014, that Newport Beach lifeguards Ben Carlson and Gary Conwell were patrolling the coast south of the Newport Pier on the Sea Watch 2 rescue boat. The two had numerous rescues throughout the busy afternoon, but it wasn't until around 5.30 p.m. that Ben would make his greatest and final rescue of them all. Ben and Gary circled in the boat to spot a swimmer in danger near 15th Street. He seemed tired and was in need of great assistance while treading water. Ben yelled to the man, asked him if he needed help, and without hesitation, Ben grabbed a buoy and launched himself from the back of the boat to rescue the man. He swam to him, he gave up his buoy, and that would come to be the act that saved the man's life. Moments later, waves came crashing in, and the outcome for Ben was not as likely. We lost Ben that day, and in honor of Ben's heroic actions, this, form, this foundation was formed uh, to do some really incredible things uh, in honor of his legacy. Um, Tim, can we go to the slide? It was two days after um, Ben's passing that one of, Dan one of uh, Ben's best friends, Danny Schmitz, who's here tonight, uh, reached out and um, saw me, I believe, as a filter to the family and said, hey, Jake, um, Ben died a hero. He saved a man's life, and he deserves a statue. At that time, we were all uh, mourning in our own different ways at our own different pace, but Danny had the foresight to see that what Ben did was absolutely incredible. And to be the first waterman in 100 years in Newport Beach, a place that is all about our water and ocean water safety, um, Ben um, created quite an impact. And Danny felt that right away. And it took all of us a little bit of time in mourning uh, to come to the realization of who Ben is and what he now means to this community. Uh, Ben's actions that day on July 6th are iconic. Uh, as you see, there's a number of men standing in the back of the room that are in support of this tonight. Uh, the chiefs are here tonight. Um, I've met with a number of you and uh, a number of city people that um, are in support of Ben's legacy. Um, so I'd like to show you a few things. Ben Carlson um, proudly served the city of Newport Beach as an ocean lifeguard for 15 years. On July 6th, he sacrificed his own life to save a swimmer in danger. Uh, I've already touched on, but the history that Ben was the first lifeguard in the 100-year history of the Newport Beach Lifeguard Department to pass while well, during a rescue. Um, our group knew that there were going to be a number of obstacles uh, to get through uh, in order to make this statue happen. And one of those was, uh, first and foremost, was fundraising. So we knew uh, that we would have to quote this out, and we wanted to find the perfect artist. So we reached out around the country. Um, Members Josh Yoakum and Danny Schmitz uh, were in touch with a number of artists right away. And as our foundation was formed, I too am an artist and I am Ben's brother-in-law. So I wanted to uh, be a part of uh, vetting for that perfect um, sculptor that would put the right touch to uh, somebody that we, we know and, and um, we love and, and wanted this piece to be most incredible aesthetically um, overall. And uh, in the midst of all this, our quotes were coming in very high and aesthetically uh, uh, very low, uh, according to my expertise and um, some of the other members on our board. It was also um, the hopes of uh, the Carlson family um, that uh, we could be involved as a foundation in making that decision. And so uh, Danny Schmitz, uh, like I said, Josh Yoakum, Chad Camo, and other members uh, weighed in on the fact that uh, I may take on this project, and um, everybody was in support of that. I'm not a traditional sculptor, but um, through uh, some counsel that I, I received from Richard McDonald, a world-renowned sculptor whose son, Rich Jr., is in Laguna Beach, uh, who's his son is a junior uh, guard out of Laguna Beach. Uh, he was very familiar with the story, and um, he had seen some of our early renderings that were in a local paper, and Rich reached out to me and said, Jake, I, I believe that you can do this. There's technology that'll allow you to do this today. Uh, in doing so, um, I realized that we had plenty of reference, uh, which was very heavy and heartfelt, but at the same time so significant and special to me um, to render Ben in the greatest way possible. Um, other things that we knew that we would have to get through is, is landscaping. 
uh, finding the right location, and also getting a landscape developer. And that's when Lifescapes International reached out. Uh, they're family friends of ours. Um, there's a designer who's with us tonight, Adam Kober, and he reached out and said uh, that they would like to donate and work pro bono to design the landscaping that would take place around the base of the statue. He also said that coming with them would be uh, an internationally renowned uh, landscape developer, uh, which is Valley Crest, who's also agreed to work with us pro bono. So at this point, we are self-funding. Uh, we have raised over $125,000 from the foundation that we are putting directly into this statue. And that's following uh, in the last 11 months that we've already also given out two $10,000 scholarships and we're putting money towards ocean water safety. So not only are we here to put up this most incredible statue in honor of Ben uh, with a world-class touch, but we also are a foundation that is here to do work for decades to come. Um, and I believe that our, our group is committed because we're longtime friends and family. So here's a little touch on who Lifescapes International is. Um, they are the ones that have designed the wind gardens and the Bellagio pools. They've done uh, custom uh, yards, uh, hotels, um, and uh, just great experiences all around the world. Valley Crest, who I just touched on, is um, responsible for doing homes, hotels, resorts, and stadiums around the world. And this is who uh, will turn our 3D file into reality. There's a group out of Santa Ana that um, Rich McDonald Jr. introduced us to called ADM, Advanced Digital Manufacturing. And Advanced Digital Manufacturing is responsible for um, creating products that, that go into aerospace, into architectural uh, uh, production, into automotive fields. Um, and ultimately, they've done a number of fine art pieces, which makes us feel very comfortable about them taking our file and rendering the statue to scale. Uh, what happens is pretty much I've created a Photoshop file that's just juiced up that is, uh, it's three dimensional. And once uh, we have full approval, we have already funded this, we'll send that file and within four months, the, st the image that we've rendered will be transferred into 3D print, then uh, transferred, then cast and enlarged um, with uh, the product that we chose, the material that we chose, which is a uh, stainless steel. Uh, we didn't want this statue to be like every other. We didn't want it to be a bronze. We felt that um, it would be incredibly fitting to do something uh, special for Ben. And um, we've chosen a marine grade stainless steel, which is uh, one of the highest, uh, most durable steels that, um, uh, for the setting of a marine environment. Uh, it does not readily corrode, uh, rust, or stain. It's got fairly low maintenance, which we've kept in mind uh, what costs may be over time. And ultimately, uh, the only maintenance of a stainless steel statue um, is soap and water about every four to six weeks. Um, our foundation has considered putting together a very small endowment that would cover any costs uh, to, to maintain that. But we also see that there may be opportunities with the lifeguards and the junior, junior guards to have some sort of interactivity uh, in, in maintaining that with us. Um, and last, we, um, excuse me, two more items to touch on is that we want this piece, like it's been touched on a number of times tonight, to not only be a beautiful aesthetic piece of artwork, but um, to somehow have inter interactivity and to educate people. And with all the technology that we're learning along the way, we've had experts come out of, of different fields. And one was um, a group uh, here out of Newport Beach that has uh, introduced us to near field communication, which is uh, much like RF technology where there's a chip. And a chip that's located in the base of the statue, uh, if you're within four feet of it, uh, if, if you have a smartphone, your mobile device has, will be triggered and has an option to go to a website or to an application that we can code or the city can uh, oversee. Uh, that's something that we can work through, but we think that it's a very special way to educate the community, to talk about Ben's story, and to um, also promote ocean water safety. So when you go on there, you're going to get a few tips about um, uh, what happens in, in, uh, uh, as you approach the beach, how to dive under a big wave, how to uh, spot a rip current, that type of thing. So we feel that that'd be a very valuable addition that uh, our group would be happy to maintain uh, in coordination with the city. And last, um, we want to talk about location. Um, the location is very important uh, with this piece of artwork. 
Uh, we wanted the statue, uh, being that it's been, it's a lifeguard, it's over, we want it to oversee the water, have a direct line of sight to the water. Um, and we also know that Ben's life took place right there at the Newport Pier. Um, for 15 years, like I said, he proudly served this city, and that's where he spent so many days. Uh, the building is now, uh, the, the, the lifeguard headquarters has been renamed after Ben. It's now the Benjamin M. Carlson Lifeguard Headquarters, which would beautifully sit in the background of the silhouette of this statue when you pull into McFadden Square, into Blackie's area there. And um, uh, we were very aware of, uh, you know, we didn't want to interrupt the environment. We went, didn't want to dig into the sand. We didn't want to uh, unnerve the Coastal Commission. So we're not touching the sand. We're not pulling out any trees. We're not removing anything that's currently there except for concrete just to replace it with more beautiful concrete and a beautiful statue. Um, around the statue, we, um, we uh, have discussed with our, with our landscape designer uh, to have uh, minimal greenery. Um, and here's a concept that you can see. Uh, again, we understand uh, we want to be responsible and respectful of um, water tolerance situations right now. So whether those are water, water tolerant plants or not, that's something for further discussion. But ultimately, we're looking for a 20 by 20 foot plot there in the middle of McFadden Square um, where the statue will stand. And um, at this time, we hope that um, you guys can can weigh heavily uh, in favor um, in honor of Ben Carlson, our Newport Beach hero, and uh, as a symbol of lifeguards everywhere. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions? Councilmember Petros. Well, you had me at hi, I'm Jake Jans. <laughs> I, uh, Jake, you and I have, have spent a lot of time together on this, and I am so proud of you for your efforts. Uh, you've heard just before us about how uh, it's the interest of this city to do things in a public-private partnership. Well, I'm sorry to say you didn't. You did this on your own, privately. You came to us when you needed our help, and that's advisable, but you did this on your own. I've attended a number of those fundraisers uh, and saw you and the team working at this. Uh, so my hat's off to you on this. Um, it, it was a, a tragic day, and it's, you know, I'm, I swim frequently, and it's funny. I always go up to the lifeguard uh, who's ever out there, and I say, rescue the guy in the yellow cap first. <laughs> I never worry about my safety out there because I know those guys in the back have got me. I'm comfortable with that, and, and I'm sure that the folks who were out that day felt that very same way, even though it was a huge surf day. Um, so it is fitting that we, we uh, provide this tribute. One thing that I do want to mention to us and to uh, my friends out who are watching this. The Carlson family has experienced a tragic loss. And it would have been very easy for them, you, to retreat into remorse, into to the pain of, of that loss. But you didn't. You didn't. You came out and you embraced this community. You came out and were proactive to engage Newport Beach to, to teach us what compassion really means, to teach us how you can come out of tragedy through faith and engage the public and engage them humbly but and respectfully. I have learned volumes, not necessarily from the Ben Carlson tragedy, but from the unity of the Carlson family. And to that, I am ever grateful, and you will always have my respect for that. I, I am, I, I, you have my support here. Um, it's been an honor for me to even have a thumbnail's worth of, of uh, time with you uh, as we move forward in this. And Carlson family, thank you ever so much. And Councilmember Curry. Well, I just want to echo Councilmember Petros's remarks. Many of us up here have had a small role in supporting this financially, and, and I just think it's great because this is really the Newport Beach community, a broad-based community coming together uh, to honor Ben's heroism and his memory. And uh, I'm so proud of our community because it's done this as a community. And it reminds us every day of the heroism of the men and women of our lifeguards, our firemen, our police officers who risk their, their lives every day on behalf of uh, all of us throughout this community. I can't think of a more fitting tribute for Ben. 
I'm so proud of you, as is uh, Councilman Petros, uh, for the work that you've done in making this happen and bringing it all together, uh, and uh, of the way the Carlson family have, have been leaders in the community in showing us how to move forward from this tragedy in a way that is uh, d that memorializes Ben uh, so that all can learn about water safety, so that we'll always remember his heroism and his memory. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for this great memorial. I can't wait for it to be uh, part of uh, our landscape here in Newport Beach. Thank you. Councilmember Piotr. Yeah, everybody's falling all over themselves to say thank you, but you really did a good job. The statue really looks cool. I think even Barry Allen would like it because it, you know, <laughs> it looks like a person, not a, a figment of a person. And the, the metal and the color and everything is just great. I look forward to seeing it. Thanks, Jake. Mayor Pro Tem Dixon. And Jake, thank you uh, for taking the consideration that you did throughout this whole project to create something that was fitting for the environment. And you and I were out there and I respect how you identified the right location and juxtaposition to the headquarters. Uh, most importantly, of the many fine aspects of what you're proposing is the importance of water safety. And of course, we know why that's important. My, I, I know I've told you this, my husband was a Los Angeles City and County lifeguard for over 30 years, in addition to being a prosecutor. At, lifeguarding was still is his passion. Um, and uh, I know his friends in Los Angeles who recently gathered, uh, as they frequently do every few years, uh, still talk about the only death they know. This is in Los Angeles County. The only death they know of a lifeguard in service was your brother-in-law. And so it is a remarkable honor to someone who did give his life in service of our community and water safety. And I appreciate that and what the entire Carlson family is doing. And your little boys will know that their uncle is a model uh, for our community. So thank you very much for all you're doing. Thank you. Councilmember Muldoon. Uh, Jake, you sold me on this many months ago on the beach, funny enough. Um, really fitting statue, beautiful. I love the iBeacon technology where you walk up and there'd be a push notification. And I hope that. Uh, I think the staff could probably arrange that so that that works with the uh, My, Is it My Newport app that we have. Uh, I think it's part of the official city and it goes towards uh, safety. And normally you have to have a device that's already activated for that notification. So if that could be done, I'd like to see that done. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other comments from staff on this one? Okay. Uh, thank you, Jake. Know, I'm going to open it up to public comment now. Anyone from the public wish to comment, please come forward. Hi, I'm Mike Glenn, resident of Balboa Peninsula. I actually have a statement uh, that Congressman Dana Rohrabacher asked me to deliver. Statement is, greetings to the Council of Newport Beach. As your congressman, I've been proud to represent you in Congress. The community spirit of your city that has been something that has inspired both me and others. One group of unsung heroes who have not yet received the praise they are due are the lifeguards who stand watch so that they, we can pr safely enjoy our wonderful beaches. I join with my beachgoing constituents in asking that you vote for this monument to the lifeguards in general, but specifically to the lifeguard, Ben Carlson. I wouldn't be your congressman today without those lifeguards, and I certainly wouldn't have had much, as much fun in my life. So I think there should be a statue to Ben Carlson, also honoring the other lifeguards next to the Newport Pier in a prominent place so the public knows just how much we appreciate these heroes. They're willing to save us. Let's be willing to thank them. As a personal note, as a private citizen, I also am greatly supportive of this, and I appreciate your time and consideration on it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back uh, for motion. Is there a Mr. Motion? Mayor, I move the action. Okay. Okay. Second by Mayor Pro Tem Dixon. Um, before we vote, I just want to make my own comments that. Um, very early on, Jake approached me on this on this project, and um, I have to say that I have been so impressed during the the evolution of uh, of the entire project, the uh, the sensitivity and the commitment that uh, that he and the family um, put forth in uh, proposing this idea. Uh, the support from the community was tremendous. I attended a number of of events where uh, where the funds were raised and it uh, just never seen anything like it um, 
the the enthusiasm and the support uh, for this project was just tremendous. And so, uh, my uh, on top of my condolences to the family for their loss, um, I think that this will be a long-lasting tribute and memorial to that unfortunate day in our city. So with that, please vote when the screen comes forth. The motion unanimously carries 6-0. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll now move on to item number 28. Uh, this is uh, ordinance um, 2015-21, fuel for beach fire rings. This is the ratification of the California Coastal Commission's approved firing plan for Newport Beach. Mr. Mayor and council members, I'll be brief unless you ask me to go longer here because I think we've all talked about fire rings an awful lot, probably too much. Uh, this is a plan that was approved by the Coastal Commission um, on, uh, on here the 11th of June. Um, it's a compromise plan. It's not a perfect plan, but I do actually am surprised we were able to get to a compromise given how polarized the different views were on that. And I give great credit to the stakeholders that were involved in this discussion from Mr. Piotr to Ms. Dixon to um, the Friends of the Fire Rings to the AQMD staff and the coastal staff. And I do want, and to residents such as Denise Oberman, I want the folks to know how challenging this was and how it's not perfect, but um, I think it is a plan that you can see from the Coastal Commission vote got a nine to one approval, which is, uh, which is pretty remarkable. So I'm hopeful that you will like it as well and will ratify it and move it. F uh, what, what would happen with that ratification is we'll continue to work to get the permit details nailed down mm. and actually get a permit to move them into the right places. So with that, I'll turn that back to you for questions or comments. Okay, uh, seeing no request to speak, I'll open this for public comment. Anyone wishing to comment, please come forward. Hello, my name is Jolene Fuentes. I'm a resident of Lake Forest, California. I own rental units in the city of Newport Beach and have for 30 years. And actually, the charm and the tradition of this great city is, is a big part of my marketing tool when I rent my units and my tenants all love the fire rings. So I would just urge your yes vote tonight for item, um, agenda item 28. And I can only say that if the California Coastal Commission can approve it, why not you? Thank you. Next speaker. Charles Farrell, City Council. Thank you. Uh, when I put this shirt on, it was white. And today it's obviously, it's become black. And that's the color of my lungs and my heart and the color of the lungs and hearts of the people in my neighborhood. Um, and all those at the fire pits too, whether they know it or not, that air gets in your body and it is not good for it. The charcoal only policy on the west side of the Balboa Pier was a tremendous success. There have been virtually no prolonged pollution from the charcoal that could be detected in the air until after dark, and I'll explain that. Since late May, mostly Thursdays through Sundays, but even tonight, there were 150 people playing volleyball, all sorts of things going on. Large numbers of people in the hundreds having fun around the 18 charcoal-only fire pits. Today, it's a big production, tents, all the usual activities, but no firewood was being burned. There is general compliance until after dark. Then a few serious wood burners take over the beach and join those who have complied with the charcoal-only rule. This handful of wood burners do great damage. Some arrive at 8 p.m. and get in a few hours before the police arrive, if the police ever show up. They're busy doing more important things. Others come out after curfew and after the police have cleared the beach, uh, usually around 11 or 12 at midnight. These groups know how to beat the laws, the police, and our neighborhood watch. They know on weekends the police are slow to arrive because they're busy doing more important things, protecting us, 
If they ever are able to show up, these fires will burn into the early morning hours. This happens almost every night, adding tremendous pollution to our air. And we're trying to get to sleep. Last night I saw people burning blankets. The night before they were burning plastics, just piling them on the fires. I could see it right from my house. I could go on and on what I've seen the last 15 years that I've lived there. All this mixed with wood, of course, people with charcoal don't do this. On a charcoal only side after dark. These fires create loads of smoke for many hours and pollute the entire beach, pier, recreational areas, our neighborhood and homes. Even with the wood band in place, we breathe burned wood, plastics and blankets and who knows what for hours each day. You don't live there, and the people behind me don't live there, at least as close as I do. This is my life daily. The city of Newport Beach, and Diane, you've done a great job. I must tell you, thank you for all that you've done for us. The city of Newport Newport Beach must gain control of its beaches, especially after dark, and come to realize that the police are just too busy doing more important things and too slow to handle it effectively. And this will get worse with these new fire rings being burning wood. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members. My name is Dan Stevens. I'm a Newport Beach lifeguard. I wanted to thank you for your yes vote on the Ben Carlson statue for doing the right thing. That was awesome. I also want to thank you for all of the time and effort you guys have put into uh, preserving some of these uh, wood burning uh, fire rings. Those are a relatively cheap and uh, easy way for families to come together, friends and families to come together and bond over a very easy thing, uh, which is roasting marshmallows, which is you know roasting hot dogs, hopefully not blankets. Uh, and it's something that I think many of us in this room have experienced, myself included. And it's because of that that I feel very strongly in favor of the wood burning coals, or the wood burning uh, rings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Honorable Council. Uh, Mike Johnson, I'm the District Director for Assemblyman Travis Allen. I guess you can't say no to a lifeguard, so big night for you guys. Uh, we, uh, I, I gave testimony on behalf of the Assemblyman at the Coastal Commission. It's nice to see the Coastal Commission come to a conclusion. It'll be nice to see this issue start to come to a conclusion. Uh, we'll continue to, uh, our office will continue to, to convey our support for wood-burning fire rings. That was a big point, an issue at the Coast Commission, as many of the, a, a couple of the commissioners were, I'd say, perplexed on the science of, of um, coal as opposed to wood and other, other alternatives. So I think there's still um, some time and some research needed in that issue. But uh, again, on behalf of someone, Travis Allen, we'll just uh, convey our support to wood burning fire rings, support the item before you in the ordinance, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, council members, uh, my name is Matt Holder. I'm currently a resident of Irvine, but I've, in the previous times, been a long time resident of Newport Beach. My mom lives down on the Peninsula Point in the house that my grandparents built 60 years ago. I grew up virtually down the street from the fire rings. And I wanted to speak in support of the wood burning fire rings. And I understand that, you know, my personal preference is that all the fire rings would be wood, wood burning. And I do understand that there's a lot of people that want charcoal only. Some few want to get rid of all the fire rings altogether. But I want to applaud the city council. I want to applaud the staff for working so diligently with all the state agencies that are involved with this, all the stakeholders, uh, community groups, the residents. Um, it's such a wonderful tradition that we enjoy here in Newport Beach that is so unique to our Southern California beaches to have these uh, wonderful wood burning fire rings that, that can bring families together and allow for them to spend time, you know, cheaply. They don't have to go spend, you know, $150 a person at Disneyland. They can come together at our fire rings in our city, enjoy our beaches. Um, the plan that's before you, I believe, is good for our residents, good for the community, good for families all throughout Orange County, and is good for local businesses. So again, I just want to thank you uh, and uh, urge you to vote yes on, on this item. Thank you. Thank you.
Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council. My name is Josh Yoakum, resident of Balboa Island. Um, I'm here to uh, uh, commend the council and city staff uh, in their efforts to ultimately uh, led to this uh, consensus firing plan that sits before us tonight. Uh, this plan represents what I would consider a, a common sense approach to bring back a long-standing Newport Beach tradition, and that, of course, is uh, wood-burning fires uh, on the sands of our beautiful beaches. This, uh, this is, is truly a piece of Americana uh, that enriches the local lives of our families, um, our students, and of course, uh, our businesses. So uh, again, I really want to commend staff and council, particularly Councilman Scott Piotter. Uh, I appreciate your diligence and commitment uh, to return this longstanding tradition back to Newport, so thank you. Um, on that note, I do have two minor suggestions. Uh, the first would be, a, you know, when you look at the, uh, the Corona Del Mar State Plan, and I think it's about six fire rings that look like they're they're butting up next to the high tide line. I'd like maybe staff to look into a, an active monitoring mitigation plan that uh, would avoid any sort of tidal range that could wipe out uh, remnants of ash in those uh, fire rings. It looks like they're a little bit closer than previous rings have been in the past, so that's one note I'd like uh, followed on. Uh, the other one would be uh, in the, uh, the, the, I believe it was the notes from the, uh, from the Coastal Commission, it said the city has a commitment to hire fire ring ambassadors, um, and they'd be there to advise beach goers of the type of fuel to use. I'm really delighted to remind the council and staff that you do have already employed by this great city uh, what I would call beach ambassadors, and I would be speaking of none other than our great and talented part-time Newport Beach lifeguards. So I'd like to, the city staff to look into them to be, of course, our uh, beach ambassadors advising everyone using the fire ranks. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Mike Glenn. Mike Glenn, resident of Balboa Peninsula. We've got, uh, we've got something here that was passed by the Coastal Commission. The plan that the Coastal Commission received was from the city of Newport Beach. They said that it was backed by the city of Newport Beach. This plan was not for 60 wood-burning fire rings. That was the last vote that this council had on the fire rings. At no other time has the public been able to come up to you and comment about any vote subsequent to the vote of 60 wood-burning fire rings. So how is it that if the last vote was for 60 wood-burning fire rings, do we have the city of Newport Beach presenting plans that are, that are countermanding a council vote and saying that the city of Newport Beach backs those plans? This is a fruit from a poisonous tree. We did something, something happened that was exactly opposite of what the council's last vote was. And the Coastal Commission took it and ran with it on good faith that the staff was giving them what the city actually backs. That's not the case. The council voted for 60 wood-burning fire rings on January the 13th. The minutes were approved two weeks later. Dave Kiff, you sent me an email earlier that said I would have an answer to this question. I would like an answer to this question. How is the city staff doing something that countermands a public vote by the city council? It's a, it's a simple question. I think that we deserve an answer to it. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, I'll close public comment on this. I'm just going to address the issue of the Coastal Commission application process. I've been doing this for 20 years here at this city. We submit applications to the Coastal Commission and it's an iterative process where the plan that is initially submitted by the city invariably is not the plan that's approved by the Coastal Commission. We don't expect the staff to come back to the City Council with every little change or question the Coastal Commission has. The remedy to the situation is what we're doing tonight. Once the Coastal Commission approves the project, that's when we, when we put our stamp of approval on the work that they did on it. There is no coming back to the city council constantly 
go with the going back and forth with the Coastal Commission. It's very clear. It's been done that way for years here. Uh, so I have to say on that. So um, any other comments from council? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Dixon. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to take this opportunity to publicly thank Councilman Piotr, the staff, uh, members of Friends of the Fire Rings, and uh, our residents, uh, led by De Denise Overman, Mike Han, others who worked with staff through, I think, plans 8 through 17, all the members I just mentioned, and as well as with the Coastal Commission in this iterative process. I truly believe it's uh, democracy in action. While I know you can't please all the people all the time, and I'm, re I'm mindful of some of the residents who spoke earlier, and I know it's been a difficult process, but I believe a compromise is the best for our community, and it heals the possible rancor that existed uh, previously. And with all the confusion over several years, I just want to publicly thank all the members involved who worked hard and diligently to come to a solution that uh, the Coastal Commission could approve nine to one, and and hopefully this council will approve as well. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Muldoon. Thank you. Uh, this is a democracy at its best, but it's also bureaucracy, arguably at its worst. Um, that being said, I'm happy to support this because uh, it's what the Coastal Commission improved. And I'm, although I like to see more wood burning, I'm grateful that uh, they decided to allow us to have some wood burning. And I was particularly concerned about expanding the original footprint of the fire rings uh, to those who did not move to the nuisance. And I know that Councilwoman Dixon and uh, Councilman Piotta worked very hard on that. And thank you for that. And I'm sure the residents who don't have uh, the nuisance moved to them are grateful as well. And Councilmember Piotta. And ditto on, on what you guys have said. And it's, it was a group effort. And it was a frustrating one, like Councilman Muldoon said. We've got bureaucracies in action between the Coastal Commission and the uh, AQMD and now the state parks jumps in and then obviously uh, trying to protect our constituents and keep that footprint and I'm glad to have this uh, finally in our rear view mirror. Thank you. Councilmember Curry. Well I'm going to be supporting the motion tonight because um, well we've already voted on a plan very much uh, like this in November of 2013. The former city council adopted a plan that looked pretty much like this. I actually bought the maps in Corona del Mar, we approved a plan that had 12 wood burning fire rings, now there's 16. Five alternative fuel uh, rings, now there's eight. The plans back then had uh, natural gas, which I think is probably superior to uh, charcoal, but nonetheless, uh, they were larger so they could accommodate a bigger group. At West Balboa, there were seven wood burning fire pits, now there's nine. Uh, one large alternative pit, now there's eight. And in East Balboa, there were eight wood burning pits, now there's uh, seven, actually went down a little bit and four alternative fuels, now there's eight. Uh, again, they were natural gas versus charcoal, and we did run into bureaucratic issues with the with AQMD and the Coastal Commission about getting them done. But that was basically the same plan, or this is basically the same plan, uh, that was introduced by the City Council two years ago. Uh, and everybody jumped up and down and said, oh my gosh, that's awful. Uh, and I'm gonna support it because it will reduce the impact of wood burning by about 50% from where it was where we began this process and because I think it's the best that we can do, although it is gonna have some extensive costs relative to administration and monitoring as we go forward. But let me speak about the process because I think the process has utterly lacked transparency and has been completely incorrect in terms of what's appropriate for, for public agencies. This began by coming to the agenda in January in violation of policy <clears throat> A6. It should have come in for a vote about whether we were going to discuss it. Discuss it. Mr. Piotr at the time offered a motion to go to six, as was pointed out, to go to 60 wood burning fire pits. 60 wood burning fire pits cannot be legally implemented on the beach without breaking the footprint of the former uh, foot, footprint of where fire rings were. So, by necessity, to implement that motion, it was necessary to move fire rings where they had not been before, and that set off a storm of opposition in the community. Now, after that motion was made, after the meeting was adjourned, two paragraphs of language were inserted into the minutes that were not spoken at the meeting that gave the staff, gave Mr. Kiff the, the authority 
to uh, promulgate additional plans and to submit them as was necessary in terms of an iterative process to the Coastal Commission. And the community, in fact, was told they could submit plans, and in fact, they did. And before we were done, we had 17 different plans. Now, Mr. Glenn asked the question, well, how did you get to the one you've got? Well, after the fire hit the fan, so to speak, and we found out that the community didn't like fire rings being moved to their homes where they hadn't had them before, Mr. Piotta was pretty furiously behind the scenes working to find a plan that would work, and we hit on this ADA strategy of where we can make some of them uh, handicapped accessible and therefore accomplish uh, the plan that we're voting on today. But that was all done behind the scenes without any public process, without any public testimony. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Dixon tried to bring this item up so that we could have public comment and so that the council could vote on which of those 17 plans they actually did support and did not support. And I'm pretty confident that there were four or five plans that would have received four, would have received seven votes. And we could have gone to the Coastal Commission confident that we had a plan that actually represented the people and the City Council of Newport Beach. Instead, we're now faced with a situation where the Coastal Commission's already acted. Uh, we've already negotiated a lawsuit settlement, as was reported earlier, based on this plan. And so the Council really has very little flexibility to adopt something else, which is why I'm glad it at least reduces by half the impact of wood smoke on our community. And let me say this, I, I like wood burning fire rings too. They're a part of the tradition. I went to Huntington Beach to enjoy them because I grew up in Long Beach and Long Beach doesn't have any fire rings at all. But we were utterly contemptuous of the health issues of our community. We simply said they should not exist or we don't believe it because it's inconvenient to believe. And I think that was an inappropriate way for us to address the health issues of our residents going forward in our community. And I hope we never do it again. Uh, in all, I think this process was, was a, a slow-moving train wreck. It completely ignored the, the proper procedures of due process, of public input, of talking to the community and getting feedback. Uh, and so that's where we are today. I will support the motion. Okay. And if there's no further uh, um, comments, uh, please vote when the screen comes up. Somebody make Do a motion. Oh, we don't have a motion? motion? Oh, well, let's have a motion. What? I'll move staff recommendation. Okay, we have a second. And I will second it. And I will just add that I would like for the city clerk to include in the minutes that Elvis is leaving the building on the back of a magnificent unicorn tonight. Yeah. But the fire ring singeing him on the end. Sure. All right. Tony, you had that one saved up all week, huh? <laughs> Prior to reading the vote, I'll read the ordinance title for 2015-21, uh -huh. an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach amending section 11.08.060 of chapter 11.08 .08 of the Newport Beach Municipal Code relating to beach firings. The motion carries unanimously, 6-0. Okay, let the record show that on uh, June the 23rd, the first order of business of the City Council for 2015 was successfully culminated. And uh, <laughs> as messy as the process was, it's like the old uh, saying goes on legislation, it's like you know, making sausage, you don't know how it's done. Um, I think we came out with a reasonable plan in the quickest, most expeditious manner possible. And uh, so I'm happy we're here. Uh, Madam Clerk. Motion for reconsideration, a motion to reconsider the vote on any action taken by the City Council, either this meeting or the previous meeting, may be made only by one of the Council members who voted with the prevailing side. Any motions for reconsideration? Seeing none, we're adjourned. Yeah.